Hello, I'm Michelle. And I'm Lucy. Welcome to the 22nd episode of Tudor Tudoriferous, the biographical podcast that examines lives in the Tudor era. And today, Edmund de la Pole. The last de la Pole for a while. Yes, yes. Mm. Well, unless we do his brother. Did we put him in the box? No. No, I don't think so, because he has, there's, I didn't find many records, so... So I don't think we'd have any information to do. <laughs> okay. I think we've had enough de la Poles now, haven't we? Mm-hmm. The surfeit of de la Poles. Yes. I'm quite looking forward to this one because um, when we first started um, researching Henry VII, Edmund seemed a huge part, didn't he? Yes. And then he sort of fizzled out over the last few months. Yeah. I mean, he sort of has a tangential role in Phillips, but... Where's where? Where's he been? Yes, we'll go we'll find over out. all of that. Mm. But first, uh, we want to make that announcement about we're making a small change to Patreon. Yeah. People have asked if we could bring the Discord channel to a lower tier. So we are doing that. We are moving it to the Noble tier. Mm-hmm. If you do sign up for Noble or are signed up for Noble, you will get an invite to our Discord channel for to chat with us about anything you feel like. And then we are going to provide a mug to people in the monarch level. Yeah. A Tudoriferous mug, not just any old mug. Yeah. A beautiful mug. (laughs) Really cool. So, yeah, come join us on Patreon. Mm, Do. You've got lots on Isabella. You've got the human body. You've got four episodes of Leonardo coming up. Yep. And we've got the next Victim is up for vote right now Mm -hmm. if you join at the merchant level or above. I'd love to say let's go straight to Edmund, but I have my personal hell to go through with the quiz. (laughs) (laughs) It'll be fine. And all of these questions are to do with Philip. Okay. Told off about that. Okay. Are you ready? No, but okay. Let's do this. Are you sitting comfortably? I am sitting comfortably. Then I'll begin. Number one. Okay. By what nickname was Philip apparently known when he was a boy? Lippy. Lippy, yes. Get fat lips. Yeah, I got one. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was easy. Number two. What was the name of the treaty signed between Philip and Henry the Seventh on the 24th of August, 1496? Intercursus Magnus. It was. Yeah. Number three. What did Philip instruct Martin de Mojica, Mojica to do that we found reprehensible? I mean, we found a lot reprehensible in that episode, but this in particular. Uh, okay. Was was he the one that was writing the diary of Juana's He was behavior? the one that was writing the diary, yes. Okay. Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah. During Philip's unplanned and unwanted stay in England, who tried to persuade him to dance? Catherine. (laughs) Poor little Catherine, snubbed by her own brother-in-law. Yeah, he wouldn't dance. And number five, why might Philip not be entirely happy about his final resting place? I don't know. I I don't remember. With whom was he interred? Juana. And? Isabella? The in laws. The in laws, <laughs> yeah. Isabella. He didn't yes. like her. And she did. I wonder if Isabella was mad about that. Well, she she wasn't in a position to. No. <laughs> Mind you, neither was he. But if she yes. had found out. I'll mm. give myself a half point for that because that was yeah. a guess, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, four and a half then. That's not bad at all. Not bad. I did good this time. <laughs> and your hell is over. You can get on and talk about Edmund. Thank goodness. <laughs> Okay, Edmund de la Pole. Come with me, if you will, mm-hmm. to the court of Maximilian, the Holy Roman Emperor. Oh, not him again. The court is very grand, even though he is on the move almost constantly. The Englishman has arrived again, demanding the troops and ships promised to him by Maximilian. What a simpleton. Maximilian, the consummate failure of promises tries to soothe the Englishman. The troops are in training. The ships are sailing from Denmark. The Danish king supports our cause. Do not worry. In the same breath, he then asks the Englishman to consider making peace overtures. 
Maximilian waxes poetical that he can bring about a reconciliation. The Englishman would have his titles returned to him. And money. Surely that would be best. Stunned, the Englishman refuses point blank and storms out. I initially thought that Henry's obsession with Edmund was solely due to Edmund being John de la Pole's brother. And then I was going to find records of two scared men or boys, his brother Richard is with him, running and hiding throughout Europe. I was pleasantly surprised that they were closer to deluded adventurers (laughs) than fleeing boys. Most of what happens in the negotiations between Henry and the rulers of everywhere that Edmund went on his flight, I've had to admit, omit from this episode, for the sake of brevity, the politics involved in the background. Otherwise, this would be days worth. If I didn't, I am. If I didn't, we would be too long. But if I did, if I did remove the sections, then I think I can make this work for everybody to understand the situation as a biography rather than the politics. So I focused more on what happened between the two people than what the politics behind everything was. But there is a bit of that in here. Well, we are a biographical podcast. We're not a political one, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. So no play-by-play for uh, for the negotiations. I'll only say they were long, convoluted, (laughs) and required a great deal of spying and lying. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I do mean a lot of spying and lying. Well, we, we've seen a bit of this, haven't we? Yes, we have. I assume that Henry was obsessed with Edmund because he was just fed up with it by now. He'd had f- uh, three of them so far, hadn't he? Yes, he had. So um, he, he probably just thought, no, come on, enough's enough. <laughs> leave, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To set the stage for Edmund, we need to revisit a couple of incidences we've already discussed in previous episodes. So, just like last time on Tudoriferous, <laughs> Edmund's father, John de la Pole, was the second Duke of Suffolk and a member of King Henry's council. Edmund was also a grand nephew of King Edward IV and King Richard III, so mm. he had a very valid claim to the throne, and many would say, a better claim to the throne than Henry. I would have thought so. Yes. I'm sure Edmund would have said that. <laughs> yes, he did. He very much did. <laughs> mm. But when you were saying just another one, this one is possibly the most dangerous one for Henry. You've got Lambert Simnel, who was clearly not a member of the royal family, and people were just pushing him forward as a member of the royal family. Yeah, I think he's the weirdest one, really, isn't he? The one that's hardest to understand. Yeah, especially since Edmund's own older brother supported Lambert. Hmm. Do we know what Edmund thought about Lambert? Is that relevant at all? Edmund appears to have been disgusted by the whole thing. All right. That's about all we've got out of it. And I think that's why he did not end up in the tower. Between him and his father, they were just, they were not supporting John DeLaw. Right. So they put a bit of space between him and his brother. Yes. They're also Mm. quite a difference in age. There was over 10 years difference. When you consider that boys at this time were moved out at a second, certain age to learn at another nobleman's house, it's yeah. possible they didn't grow up together. And yeah, there was a lot of brothers and sisters, wasn't there? Yes. Yeah, there were mm. quite a few. The other person that Henry had been focused on was Perkin Warbeck, another person that could not be proven to be who he was. So again, there was less support for him. Whereas Mm. Edmund was very clearly part of the royal family. There was no way he could contest it. Yeah, he he was who he was. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Edmund's older brother, John de la Pole, the first Earl of Lincoln, (laughs) rebelled against Henry and was killed in the Battle of Stoke on the 16th of June, 1487. Oh, hang on. I know. I thought thought this was the anniversary, but no, we're on the 18th. It was two days ago, the anniversary. Okay. (laughs) Oh, really? 
You yes, guys have an like, anniversary of this? <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying it? that oh. is what that it would have been the anniversary. <laughs> if, <laughs> I know we it. don't. Nobody's heard of the thing. <laughs> no one knows John de la Pole. No one knows the Battle of Stoke. <laughs> oh my goodness, I am so slow some days. Mind you, I mean, we've got an anniversary of Guy Fawkes. So. Yeah, <laughs> which seems really... Uh, okay, from an outsider, it's very strange. it seems hilarious that you guys use fireworks and you burn an effigy of Guy Fawkes when his crime was attempting to blow up Parliament. <laughs> mm, I think everyone thinks, oh, well, he's got, he's got a point. <laughs> yes. What is that poem? Remember, remember the 5th of November? Yeah, there's a town in East Sussex called Lewis, and they have they burn effigies not just of Guy Fawkes, but they choose somebody each year to burn. I think Tony Blair was one year, <laughs> and I should imagine it's probably oh, really? Boris Johnson this year. <laughs> oh, I wonder if they get away with that in Canada, or would people be horrified? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's odd that it's just this one town that's done it for years. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting to see who they choose. It might be Putin this year. I wonder if they have a history of or a list of who they've burned in effigy. Mm, must do. Yeah, look it up. Lewis, L E W E S. Okay. In East Sussex. I might do so. Hmm. Actually, I will once we're done. <laughs> I know me. <laughs> <laughs> One would be perfectly reasonable to assume that John's rebellion would result in Edmund being Im immediately thrown into the tower. We've seen that with others, mm -hmm. but this didn't happen. It is possible that Edmund's father, who took the king's side over his son John's, managed to maintain the king's trust, and that was extended to his young sons. But it appears Edmund was also disgusted with his brother. But here is the question. Was he disgusted with his brother for going against the king, or was he disgusted that his brother was not the head of that army and to be taking the throne. Yeah, I mean, he must have been as confused as we were that he followed a young boy who everybody knew wasn't who he said he was. Yes, exactly. Mm. So there seems to be... You might be baffled more than disgusted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, there is controversy because there aren't very many writings, but there is a bit. But Edmund's writings, we'll talk about it later, are very difficult to decipher. Right. Edmund and Richard did not end up in the tower. Edmund would have only been 16 and perhaps still loyal to the king. He was most definitely still loyal to the king, but everywhere I saw was perhaps because people speculated mm. that his loyalties would have been pulled between his brother and the king. And Rich, Richard was the one who speculated might actually have been John's yes. son. Yes, yes. Mm. Speculated. speculated. I found nothing on Richard. I went looking <laughs> because I was. I found something in the in the Richard the Third Association magazine, or whatever they called themselves, um, the Ricardian. Oh yes, there was something in there, but that's that was the only. Okay, I wonder where they got mm. their information. Because I didn't find anything about that. I thought when I realized how little Richard was mentioned little Richard. in everything. Yeah, poor little guy. <laughs> I thought I'd loop him into this and just sort of make it an Edmund and Richard, but I found nothing. Mm. So we stuck with Edmund. Edmund was certainly under his father's control. He was 16. He was not considered an adult. And his older brother, John, was either nine or ten years older than Edmund. So, yes, he could have been raised in a completely different household and not really known his brother. Mm. July 1483, at the age of 12, Edmund was made a Knight of the Bath for Richard's coronation. All right. So you would think that that would also be held against him. Because all of other <laughs> Richard III's retainees did not fare well in Henry's reign. Well, he forgave John. Yes. Who'd gone through the same thing. I think if you if you swore allegiance to Henry and said, you know, he was Richard was king at the time. What 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 was I meant to do? Yes. Then Henry might have thought, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, and he was young. He was 12. It's hmm. not like he had a choice in that. Yeah. Three yeah, I mean, that, must, that must have been a consideration. He was a boy. Mm hmm That's what I'd like to think. Mm. 
Three years later, he would also attend the coronation of Henry and his wife. This is going to be Edmund's cousin, Elizabeth of York. Yep. Mm -hmm. Edmund later was married to a Margaret Scrope and had a daughter, Elizabeth de la Pole. But I don't have dates for either event. I also have no information on what actually happened to Margaret Scrope. She gets two or three mentions and then she just disappears from all records. At least what I found. If we ever find anything on Elizabeth de la Pole, it might mention more about her mother. But I couldn't find it in any of Edmund's resources. In 1492, this is the critical year for Edmund. His father dies and Edmund inherits the title for the Duke of Suffolk and the Marquisette of Suffolk. So the Duke and a Marquis or a Marquis. Mm. In this same year, Edmund was with Henry VII on campaign in France at the Siege of Boulogne. Boulogne, yeah? I think his dad... Oh, no, he can't have been, can he? I was about to say his dad was there, but you've just told me he was dead, so... He was dead. Obviously not. (laughs) Yeah. This battle was intended to force the French to give up support of Perkin Warbeck. So he is on hand for that one. The maneuver was successful in regards to Perkin Warbeck, but it raises questions about Henry's faith in Edmund. Because he was well watched. Again, spying and lying. (laughs) Edmund's father had died. I suppose John, his brother, hadn't shown any signs of rebelling yet, had he? No, No. he hadn't. He just disappeared. Mm. Oh, he had already disappeared, had he? Yes. Oh, right. So I suppose, yeah, that would make sense to keep an eye on the brother, wouldn't it? Yes. Mm. So he kept him quite close. Um, many think that Henry trusted him, but I'm, um, yeah, no, I don't <laughs> think so. So Edmund's father had died, and the transfer of the titles was to be taken care of when they returned to England. This is where people start showing that Henry possibly, more than likely, didn't trust Edmund or that Edmund had lost favor in the sight of the king. Henry had Edmund agree to give up the titles both the Duke and the Marquis, and be reduced to the Earl of Suffolk. I remember reading about that, but I didn't work out why he'd agreed. Hmm, Edmund, and this is where it gets confusing. Some are telling us that Edmund received £5,000 from Henry to agree to this. Every document I found said that he was fined £5,000, like death duties, to inherit just the Earl of Suffolk for re- for link relinquishing the titles and some of the lands that his brother had lost. He was given those, so lost the titles, received the title of Earl of Suffolk, but was given some lands that his brother's brother uh, John had lost. Mm. So when John was attainted for treason and died, all of his lands were seized. They didn't go back to the brother. And some of those lands had been passed from his father. The Duke of Suffolk lands were split to be given to John. Edmund got some of those back, but not nearly enough of them. So was that all just based on the fact that his brother had rebelled, so you went, you're not to be trusted, or that the family are going the to be... The records don't say a thing about why. So, there's quite a bit of speculation about this. Some people believe that Edmund agreed and had to give up the title only because he did not have enough income to sustain the titles. And this wouldn't have been an act by Henry that would put Edmund's back up. Oh, so I suppose his dad wouldn't have passed down much money, did he? Because he was notoriously skint, wasn't he? Yes, Mm. yes. In the 1400s, I don't know if it's like today, but in the 1400s, the title and your income were irrevocably linked. If you did not have enough money, you could not retain that title. So how did his dad manage to hold on to it then? Just because he already had it? Probably. He came into it before Henry and Henry couldn't take it off Mm. of him. But this is an actual transfer of a title from one person to another. And All through history, we see that the person receiving those titles would pay money to the monarch for the privilege of getting those titles. Edmund didn't have that money. He didn't make enough. He didn't own enough. And even all the lands that came to him was not enough to sustain the dukedom title. Mm -hmm. So anybody else in this situation 
it's up to the king to tell them you cannot continue to be a duke. We will reduce your rank to this because this is how much income you have. So the actual money you've got is how much you pay for the to be either a duke and, or an earl, and a duke's more expensive than an earl, or how is it the money you can, you no. have to retain the lifestyle that would go with it? How much money you have to retain the lifestyle? Right. You have to retain or have a certain amount of income per year in order to retain the title. And he didn't. I don't know what the situation is now. I don't move in those sort of circles. <laughs> it's never been... Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. Do you have any poor dukes over there? Well, they always claim they are because they're forking out all the money for um, these massive <laughs> for the buildings. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, there's a documentary going on right now about that, but I can't remember what it was called. Anyway. We're in this situation where we know that it happened, we know that he signed off on it, but we don't know how he felt about it. But I do wish I was a fly on the wall for that conversation. <laughs> yeah. You don't have all the lands of the duchy, so you must give up the title. But, sorry, you took those lands from my brother, and those lands had been given from my father as a temporary thing to my brother. They should have stayed with my father and come to me. Can't you give them back to me? No. You have to give up the title. I will give you some of the lands back. Stare off. We know that some of it went to Mrs. Perkin, didn't we? At least she was yes. buried on one of them. Yes, Lady Gordon. Fifield? Rings a bell. I believe so. Something like that. I have, yeah. I have got a memory after all. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and you have to pay me $5,000 and pledge your loyalty to me. Loyalty to me. And this was pre Empson and Dudley. And yep. It just shows that it was all a bit ropey before. Yeah, he was being fined and the king was deliberately lowering his status in the country. Which is odd because nothing's going to make someone rebel more than completely humiliating them and taking all their stuff. Yeah. Hmm. I don't think Henry was a, had much sort of psychological insight, really, did he? <laughs> no, not at all. Not Especially how, not in this case. No. Whatever it was, it backfired if he thought this was going to work. Even though Edmund was demoted, he was still required to be prominent, and he was still prominent at court because he was the queen's cousin. Hmm. So you can't exclude him even though you've demoted him. I wonder what the queen thought about We'll never know what the queen thought about any of this. No, we never know about it. I wish she had a diary. Hmm. We didn't know what he thought about what she thought about Perkin, because he, he could have been her brother. Yeah. Hmm. But I doubt he was. I honestly don't think he was. No, I doubt he was. Yeah. <laughs> Two years later, 1494, when Prince Henry was created the Duke of York, Edmund was one of the four knights staging the tournaments, which was a placement of extremely high honor. Because you were arranging a team, your team would win, and accolades would come to you. So you were the focus of that team and everybody's attention. Three years after that, we still see Edmund in the good graces of the king when he led troops against the Cornish rebels uh -huh. at Blackheath in June. <laughs> Next episode from Lucy. Yes. Yeah. Just, yes, yes. I'm just thinking, actually, I, he hardly appears in my episode. <laughs> I'm like, what do oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. The Lord Dobney seems to be the one that was really running things. Yes. Edmund was one of the people leading troops. Mm. So I believe there were three. Yeah. But still, he was leading troops. Right. Henry had allowed him to gather an army. Yes, in and you England. don't do that. Well, I suppose you can might be able to gather an army because you'd be unlikely to be able to persuade an army suddenly to turn on the king, would you? So mm -hmm. he might not have thought it was that dangerous. We can hope, mm. except that they were using that army to put down already a rebellion. Mm. Could they have just swapped sides? I don't know. Didn't seem likely. <laughs> yeah. Whatever favor he did have, it quickly changed in 1498. Edmund and a group of courtiers got in an argument outside Allgate in London. The argument turned into a fight that escalated into a brawl that escalated further into the murder of three men. Hmm. Edmund, who had previously failed to turn up to an earlier hearing for other unknown charges, so yes, he's a saint, <laughs> he was now given the opportunity to appear. 
except since he didn't appear before, he was physically hauled in front of the judges of the king's bench. Mm. This doesn't seem that unreasonable to us. No, but if, if you're a, an earl, I think you would think it was very unreasonable. <laughs> yes. Mm. The king's bench is the royal criminal court in Westminster Hall, not facing the king or mm. the counselors for his behavior which an earl or a duke would expect to happen. Yeah, I mean, this is he's with the commoners, presumably. Yes. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, they indicted him for murder. I absolutely loved that all of the accounts. Edmund wasn't apologetic or even defending his actions. Instead, he was outraged that he, a nobleman, was being charged with the murder of a measly commoner. He's coming across as a good, nice man, isn't he? Oh, <sighs> yeah. I shouldn't be charged because that man was a commoner. It, it, it's perfectly fine for me to kill him. I'm an earl. That was his argument. That's his defense. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So he's just admitted to doing it. Oh, yes. Because there's nothing wrong with me doing it. Yeah, fair enough. I'm within my right. I should think there's some else around now who'd probably make yeah. the same arguments. <laughs> oh, my goodness. True to some of the earlier episodes we've had of the involvement of the king's shady men, Sir Reginald Bray, the precursor to Edmund Dudley and Richard Empson, mm. the evil buggers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to take that word out. <laughs> It has a different meaning over here than I think it does over there. Well, what? Did, which, which word? I said bugger. Oh, but yeah. So bugger is a sort of Somerset phrase, really. He's a right old bugger. Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it in then. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Use. It doesn't mean doesn't mean what it used to mean. <laughs> but Sir Reginald Bray was there, and he took great delight in pronouncing the indictment for murder. I wonder what there was between those two. I don't know. He's in the box, so we might find out, mightn't we? Yes, he is in the box. <laughs> He's in my box. Your cat might have nicked, <laughs> nicked him out of your box. Actually, my box is completely empty, so I have to reprint them all because I'm not going to be mm. able to search around my house and find where he's hidden them all. I found the other ones in the vent the other day. I found three in a vent. So I was going to kick him out of it, but then I thought, you know what? He's having so much fun, so I'll just keep reprinting them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sucker for a mom. <laughs> It's just so cute watching him dive in there, grab one and run away chirping. <laughs> Perhaps you could have two two boxes. There's one for him and, and one a real for me. one. Yeah, that's mm. a good idea. That's better than my thought. Constantly <laughs> reprinting. I will still reprint them. I just made well, I'll just cut up paper and put it in there. Yeah. Fold it up. He's asleep beside me. As stated, this is not the normal course of justice for the fourteen hundreds. He should have been with the king, facing the king's counsellors. He should have been tried by his peers, presumably. Yes. It's especially strange when we see the coroner's report in no way mentioned Edmund as striking the blow that killed the man. But he admitted it. Um, I'm not sure if he's admitting it at this point now, or if it's just, regardless of what happened, he's a commoner. Mm. I'm not sure. But I think he just said that he did him not defending his actions or defending his actions in a way of it being fine even if i did or if i did yeah. is paraphrased so we don't have his actual words i have found court reports really helpful in finding those times where you have to stop think and wait a second that's not what was supposed to happen in this one, the strangeness of the proceedings are additionally highlighted by the fact that other courtiers, courtiers of a lesser rank than Edmund for this same offense were in the king's council and were let off and never indicted for murder. So Edmund would be right in, think, in assuming that that would be yes. what would happen to him. So he yes. might not have been saying, I had every right to kill that commoner. He might be just saying, well, everybody else got off. <laughs> Why are yes. you picking on me? And in two of those cases, there was absolutely no doubt that they had murdered the people that they had been charged with. Absolutely no doubt. Whereas the coroner doesn't say that Edmund struck the final blow or the, the critical blow. Mm. Two that were mentioned in The Winter King that I was able to find information on elsewhere were Matthew Baker, a.k.a. Matthew Basquet, one of the favorite jousters who was also a joint governor of Jersey and Guernsey, 
He killed possibly twice in two different time periods, and neither one of them brought an indictment. And he was only a knight. Hmm? The other was Roland de Velleville, who was also a favorite jouster. So these are men of his rank, also in jousting, like tournaments like he was. And Roland was a minor official for the crown as well, and he is also believed to have gotten away with murder definitely once, possibly twice. And it just went in front of the king's council, and they basically said, shame, shame, don't do that. Mm. So Edmund might have a point in feeling a bit put out. Yes. Mm. It's this charge that had Edmund flee England for the first time. Though I think he... Was he, was he going to be imprisoned or... Nobody knows, because he refused to stay around to find out what would have happened. If it's already Mm. gone sideways and it's being held up in a different court than it should be, you would think that maybe the rest of it's going to go even worse than it should? Mm. Yeah, he's probably very sensible to get out. Yes. And though I call it fleeing, I'm pretty sure he would have called it leaving in protest. (laughs) Yes. I'm not fleeing. I'm doing this because you have insulted me, sir. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm storming out, that's what I I'm doing. I am storming out, and I'm not storming out by myself. I am leaving with a suitable entourage for a duke, because I was born to be a duke. <laughs> he took a lot of people with him. <laughs> mm. ah. Edmund landed in, I think it's called Gine? G-U-I-S-N-E-S? Is it Gine? Gine? Is it Gine? I don't know. No, just make just a guess. Yeah. Sir James Tyrell, who was a former retainer of Richard III, was captain uh-huh. there. We know about him. He mm-hmm. is a, he's accused of killing the da, boys da, in the da, tower the in, in the Shakespeare's towers. Richard. Yes. And this might have been and the beginning of And he confessed to James... it in real life as well, apparently. Really? Hmm. But that was not what he was executed for. I don't think mm. we're doing him, so he was executed for something else. Are we? Not, well, he gets executed because of Edmund. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yes, that's right. Yes, but not... Be- and I think he was tortured and he said, I might as well be hanged for a sheep and a lamb. Pretty much. <laughs> I, was, yeah. um, I also killed the boys in the tower. Yes. But I think he was racked, wasn't he? Or some, something. Oh, Something he was unpleasant happened to him. Very unpleasant. Hmm. Anyway, jumping ahead there, sorry. Yes, and I'm going to make a statement right now. Um, If you want to research it, it's fine, but I refuse to research Tudor torture. Not doing it. <laughs> no, well, I suppose it might be part, it might sort of come in peripherally in that people are tortured. Yes. But we won't do a special episode. Mm-hmm. James Tyrell aided Edmund, providing him money, more people, more goods, and sanctuary. Oops. <laughs> mm. When Edmund left there, he initially traveled to Calais before continuing on to Burgundy. Ah, now let's Margaret. think. Who's in Burgundy? <laughs> <laughs> Stomping her feet. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you can imagine that this would have made Henry extremely uncomfortable. Here was Edmund going to the same low country areas that his brother, John, did. And everybody prior else. Prior to his own rebellion. <laughs> and everybody else, mm-hmm. yes. Henry immediately sent diplomats to threaten Philip of Burgundy with a reinstatement of the economic sanctions that Henry had imposed earlier. He used the stick on Philip, but the carrot on Edmund. With Warbeck still at large, Henry could not risk Edmund either pushing his legitimate claim to the throne or his legitimate support being lent to Warbeck. Either way, it would be a catastrophe. Yeah, I always think of these people... Is coming one after the other, but there's a certain amount of overlap as well with these, isn't there? Yes, especially Mm. for Perkin and Edmund. Henry presented the carrot in a great honour to Edmund. He sent an official diplomatic entourage to communicate with Edmund. It doesn't sound that great, but diplomatic entourages were only sent to foreign heads of state. They weren't sent to people of his own country or people who were not kings Hmm. i mean these diplomatic entourages weren't even really supposed to communicate this specific one they don't usually communicate with the other diplomats they are specifically there to present an item to the king of another country and he sent them to edmund Hmm. who was on the on the run from a murder charge 
Yes. Mm. And not even a duke at this point. He was still an earl. He was still demoted. Guilford was sent to convince Edmund that Guilford was on Edmund's side and to know that the king was too. So the king was saying, yes, I understand. No, you won't be indicted for murder. We can reconsider your titles, which is huge. And was he being serious or just yes. trying to lure him back? He was. It seems to be a completely honest presentation like if i can get you to stop rebelling it's one less thing i have to think about i'm willing to buy you off yeah it makes sense mm -hmm. you don't have to, you don't have to believe it within yourself you just have to think i can't i can't be bothered with another one just pay yes. him the money give him the yeah. give him the title we've already got warbeck floating around yeah. gathering support from different monarchs around the world i don't need him to do it too guilford told Edmund, that the king was eager for him to return to England as a loyal subject, he would be pardoned for murder, ensure that no dishonor or harm would come to him, and they would reconsider his titles. Guilford did pull Edmund aside and quietly warned him that if he did not return under these conditions, he, quote, may never look to recover nor to come again, end quote. And presumably he'd lo lose his earldom, would he? Yes, he'd lose everything, and he'd never be allowed to return to England. Edmund came back. I was going to say, well, Henry's got him over, over a barrel already, isn't he? Mm -hmm. There's not a lot he could do. Yes. But while he didn't lose his title of Earl, he did not regain the other two titles. Well, yeah, I noticed the way it was worded, they'd reconsider his titles. They didn't say, yes. we'll give it back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And they were true to their word. They did reconsider, and the reconsideration said, no, no, you still don't have the money to, to hold the dukedom. Yeah. But this time we're going to ensure it has nothing to do with your status. It has to do with the fact that you don't have the income. Mm. Like, really, it's not you. <laughs> it's the situation. Yeah. It's not you. It's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I don't want you to have it. <laughs> yes. One problem with this is that Henry and his court, after a couple of months, seem to have become very focused on Edmund not to be included at the status of a duke in marriage proceedings for Arthur and Catherine. Which means that Edmund was now very publicly being put in his place. He's the queen's cousin. He, in his head, should be a duke. They said they were going to reconsider but I'm only allowed to be in the procession as an earl. Yeah, I mean, that's a sort of visualization of his humiliation, isn't it? Where he where he mm -hmm. stands in the procession. Yeah. And we know how it, how funny the people get about that, because there was that um, fisticuffs, wasn't there? At, yes. Like with the fourth <laughs> funeral, where people were saying, I'm going first. No, I'm going first. How appropriate is that? <laughs> You were fighting in life, and we're going to fight <laughs> in death while you're there. Okay. Um, some people say that this was actually the reason for Edmund fleeing, because this procession was set up before Edmund fled. But Edmund had assumed that when he returned, that that would be corrected. Right. But it wasn't. So there is some debate about him leaving or becoming disloyal because of the indictment. Other people think that it was these marriage proceedings and the plans for them that was one of the reasons for his flight and his anger. And I'm saying it's a possibility because Polydor Virgil wrote that. Right, so we can more likely to believe that than had Bernard Andre written it, for instance. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, I'm like, Polydor was very biased. Was. We know he was biased. Mm. But in this case, would bias make him make that assumption? I can't see him saying that because neither one of those puts Henry in a bad light. Mm. So I'm not, it gives it a feeling of being correct just because there's no obvious gain for Polydor. But since he left right after that indictment, to me, I think it was the indictment. Maybe the proceedings may have led up to it and the indictment was just pushing him over the edge. Had the arrangement for the procession, that, that had all been sorted out before he left. Yes, so, but he expected it to be changed when he came back. But did he have any reason to think he'd be a duke when he came back before he left and Guildford came and said, you know, a word in your ear? 
No. Mm. So Guilford said that they would reconsider mm. his titles. So I'm thinking he said, reconsider, I've got them. Yeah. I, I'm going to ignore the reconsider word and just say, I'm going to get my titles back. Yeah, it's like talking to a child, isn't it? So I'll think about it. Yeah. I've thought mm -hmm. about it and you still can't have any sweets. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We'll talk about this later, which means no. <laughs> <laughs> this could have been part of the issue. There is a researcher, historian, her name is Alison Hanham, and I managed to get quite a number of her journal articles. She wrote one that was specifically on Edmund de la Pole being a defector. And she makes a very good point about pride. Yeah. Edward Stafford, the Duke of Buckingham, mm -hmm. He now, because Edmund had been demoted to an earl, had preferment at every occasion. Every occasion Edmund would be at would force in his face that somebody who was not as close to the royal family, because he is the queen's cousin, hmm. Edmund de la Pole is the queen's cousin, and he thinks he should be a duke and a marquis. If Edmund had retained his titles, he would have precedence over Stafford at everything. I'm sure that's a huge thing for them. Yes. I mean, it seems tri seems trivial to us, but yeah. it would be a massive thing for them. Yeah, especially for a man who was into the tournament scene, which means he wanted fame. Yeah. You don't enter the tournaments if you're not looking for fame and glory. And now you're constantly being put behind somebody that you outranked. Mm. Yeah, I would have thought that's that's a sort of personal thing which would push people over the edge rather than a sort of general political thing. I mean, that would be the last straw, wouldn't it? Yes. Some people are saying that the indictment just gave him the excuse. Mm. Others are saying, no, it was the indictment that made him flee because he would never know the outcome. He had already assumed the outcome was going to be bad. Mm. It's really hard to tell. It's so far away and I doubt anybody actually asked him, why did you leave? <laughs> and he would give an honest account. No, no. Didn't 1499. This is the first meeting between Philip of Burgundy and Henry VII, and it was intended to negotiate the marriage of Henry's son, Henry, to Philip's daughter, Eleanor. Hmm. I didn't even know that existed. <laughs> <laughs> I remember us saying poor Eleanor because Isabella didn't want to meet her. <laughs> she wanted Charles to come to Castile. Hmm. But I didn't know Henry had been thought to marry Eleanor. Yeah, she was, a, she was not really mentioned much, <laughs> I guess. No. And Henry the Seventh and Philip's relationship hadn't soured so badly yet. No. It's here that we first see Edmund's character in the glory portion. I want glory. I want to be famous. A jousting tournament was held. The tournament was proclaimed in the name of Edmund de la Pole, Earl of Suffolk. There are a few ways to look at this. I thought it was really odd. But it turns out that jousters could be singled out for that honor for an entire tournament. This means no matter what happens, that tournament gives honor to the person who was called for. So it's sort of like I dedicate this in the honor of so-and-so. And Henry did that for Edmund. And I got really confused. Mm, that, does, that seems, yeah, I can't see it. I can't see any yeah. reason for this. No, especially since this is usually held for somebody who had been loyal, successful at jousting, mm. and had done something extraordinary for the crown. So far, all Edmund had done was flee and demand things. Mm. Yeah, it's a sort of sports personality of the year you're getting, aren't they? But yeah, yes. he hasn't shown a particularly nice personality so far. Not a trustworthy one. No, mm. and so I did not understand this. But we're going back to uh, Alison. In this particular case, what she claims or believes is that the tournament was called for Edmund to show the world that Wolf, though he was a Yorkist claimant and he had fled, he was firmly under the control of Henry. Yeah. He is going to do this. He's going to do this with his name being claimed. But the only reason I'm doing this is because I am personally totally convinced that he will never go against me again. Ultimate loyalty. So he's setting it up. It's it's become a, a sort of fait accompli. It's yes. he's set it up to say this is what I think will happen, and therefore it has to because he's set it up. Yes, mm. yes. I am in control. My throne is not under jeopardy. Yeah, this is fine. Yeah. This action could also have been particularly aimed at Philip, 
to be fair, we do have successful accounts of Edmund being an extremely successful jouster, being bold, stout, and brash, is as they explained it. <laughs> We're also told in these accounts that he was easily angered and hot-tempered. Even so, this was a consummate theatrical performance towards Philip. Philip, who had supported Perkin Warbeck and had harbored traitors was now seeing that one of the most dangerous traitors that could have been was returned to loyalty to Henry. So it is a piece of diplomatic theater. So don't bother. Don't bother trying to turn him. He's my he's my exactly. Yeah. He's mine. Exactly. And other country ambassadors would be there because they were signing treaties and discussing a marriage negotiation. So they would know this information and they would take it back to their courts. So this is really a way for Henry to show every single monarch in Europe that I firmly have the throne of England. It is not in jeopardy. Yep. Apart from Perkin. <laughs> Apart from Perkin. Then to hammer this home, and this is how we know it's diplomatic theater, Henry had copies of the tournament challenge and the declaration sent to Charles VIII of France, James IV of Scotland, and Ferdinand and Isabella. He is mine. He is my subject, and he is under my thumb. Don't worry, I've got this. Mm. So to some of them, to Ferdinand and Isabella, he's saying, don't worry, you know, the marriage can go ahead, it's all sorted out. Yes. But to James and probably Charles, he's saying, you know, don't bother messing with Edmund because it's too late, I've got him. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. So he does have a bit of psychological insight after all. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if it's him or if it's his counselors doing that. There was a lot of back alley negotiations happening with a whole bunch of different people, including Edmund. What colors he was allowed to wear, what he was supposed to do in the joust, who he was supposed to take a favor from. Like, it was really, really scripted. The actual jousts where they're hitting each other can't be scripted, but all the presentations, everything was very much a performance of theater. Right. And I wonder what was dangled in front of him at this point, because presumably he'd already heard that he wasn't getting the dukedom. Oh, I bet you they probably told him we'll reconsider after the joust. And then, and then it'll be after, and it'll be a bit later. It'll be, and then, oh, just before bedtime, we'll have a think about it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really, really, really seems to be. Every time I saw a mention of him and how they were basically using him to show Henry's control over the country... It was always, well, we can reconsider this, or I may think of giving you these lands back. It was always, I'm dangling a carrot, and if you be a good boy, you might get it. And in his head, I hear, I'm getting mm. this, so I will do this. And none of it actually came to pass. He didn't get anything back. Mm. The only thing that he did get was that he was not indicted for murder. Well, that's something, I suppose, but... That's something. Yeah, but then he wasn't expecting to be. In his head, he shouldn't have been yeah. charged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He sounds like quite a shallow person that can be twisted with little trinkets. And I know they're quite yes. big trinkets as far as the nobility is concerned, but. Yeah. yeah. Well, it would have been, if he had been given back the dukedom and the lands, it would have been equating to now of giving somebody several million dollars. Mm. So the carrot was a big carrot. I suppose that's, yeah, that's not little trinkets, is it? No. You need me to fight in a joust? I can fight in a joust. Yeah, I'll do that for millions of dollars. <laughs> I'll probably end up horribly injured, but I still do it. <laughs> and he loved it anyway, oh, didn't he? Jousting, so. Yes, yeah. he did. And he was good at it. That's one of the reasons why it was so big to have him in those tournaments is because he was flamboyantly chivalrous. That's one of the descriptions I found. <laughs> Flamboyantly chivalrous. I was like, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, well, certainly chivalrous is not the term now. It's not being kind and thoughtful. No. And <laughs> is it? No. Not at all. If Suffolk had returned to England, so Edmund Suffolk, with the idea of regaining his father's titles and lands, like we were just saying, he's going to be very disappointed. Mm. He was allowed to participate in great occasions of state and any pomp and circumstance, jousts, anywhere where his chivalry, his flamboyant chivalry, <laughs> would add to the court. Henry would be happy to trot him out for all to see. But it became very clear that he was not trusted and that he was not going to get anything back from Henry. 
didn't take that long for him to figure this out. Well, a couple of years. <laughs> Sounds like quite a long time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit like George, Duke of Clarence, when he sort of thinks, now hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hang on. That's kind of what I felt. <laughs> yes. Like, when do you see that color drain out of his face? Mm. Like, oh, this isn't going to happen. No. They've been lying to me. Very much. That's a lie. I didn't get Mm. this. And it wasn't until now that he started to understand what was actually happening because he discovered that he and his associates were being spied on. What the Tudors called under a strict watch and ward. Ward is prison, but in this case, it was just a strict watch. They were being spied on. I thought on. everyone was spied on in uh, Henry the Seventh's time. <laughs> That's what it seemed so like I. when I was looking at the conspiracy against him. It seems you have spies everywhere. Everywhere. Mm. Uh, yeah, there's um, uh, the spies at Tudor Court. I think I found that as a journal article. I, don't, I printed out so many the <laughs> last time I was at the university. I was like, I want this one. Oh, I'm horrible. Okay. It may not have been overt, but it was obvious. But rather than going after Edmund personally, Henry decided to go after his retainers and associates specifically and erode his support. So he was forcing them into financial bonds for good behavior. He was taking land from them. He was reducing their income, reducing their ability to bring men of arms with them. Because you have to have a certain status to bring in certain people, which I didn't know was a case. Like, did you know that they were expected to supply different types of military depending on their rank? Oh, right. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. You brought knights with you if you were mm. a duke. You had to be able to supply the horses, the armor, the training for these men. And as you go down the ranks, less was required of you when it was military was called Makes for. sense, I suppose. Yeah. Financially, I mean. Yes, so Henry going after specifically his retainers is actually to remove the possibility of Edmund creating an efficient and effective army. I can see a lot of miffed people, though. Yes. All he's doing is ticking off more and more and more people. Because people, I mean, you're talking about uh, supplying specific soldiers for various things. I mean, if it's it's a rebellion, all that goes out the window, doesn't it? Yes. Mm. And this is the wait a minute time. For Edmund, because we get back from Calais and another lawsuit is brought against him and brought in front of the court of the King's Bench at Westminster. This is not going well. (laughs) What's that one about? Is that the murder charge or a a different one? No, this is for something else. This is just a lawsuit about his behavior uh, towards land transfer for his own people, something that he is supposed to have the right to do. Basically, a duke, an earl, when there were disputes in their area of influence or the properties that they owned and were delegated to, they were supposed to be the court for that and make those decisions. He was brought forth to Westminster for a court case against him, litigation. His decline in his lands of authority, so they're now removing his ability to use the law in these lands as well. These are all in East Anglia. Were due to Henry undermining his authority, specifically through these courts. And then also having all of his retainers forced into bonds. I suppose it makes a difference to how people view him as well. I mean, they might have thought, well, that's who we go to if we've got a problem, or he'll he'll be the judge at the court. But if he's being systematically humiliated at, at court, then no yes. one's going to be looking up to him, are they? No, they'll bypass him and go to somebody more yeah, powerful. like John de Vere and in that area, I suppose, wasn't it, in East Anglia? Mm. Yes. Yes. Yes, you can see why the de, de Poles, yeah, you can see where this is going, yeah. can't you? Yeah, so his retainers are being forced into bonds, so they're financially crippled. Mm. So they're now actually having to get loans from people to keep up their end of what they're supposed to be doing because of Edmund. And then Henry now interfering with all of his uh, legal decisions and his managing of his own area of influence. Henry was undermining everything he could. So do you think these retainers would blame Henry or would blame Edmund for their situation? I would think they would blame Edmund. Mm. It's easier to blame the person that the king would defend you against than it would be to go after the king. I think that would be the safer way to go. You don't want to be treasonous. No. 
especially if you're watching what's happening to somebody who sort of was treasonous, but not really. Because <laughs> <laughs> when he fled the first time, it was just because of his lands and that that particular court case. It wasn't because he was planning on taking over mm. the crown. And this was still happening to him. His decline was also a contrast and possibly made worse in his own mind by the rise of Thomas Howard, the Earl of Surrey. Oh, yes, this is where the Howards make their entrance, really, isn't it? Yes. Oh. Yes, it yeah, is. Yeah, we get to hear a bit more about them later on, don't we? <laughs> yes, and we will hear about them for multiple seasons. Yes. Thomas Howard began encroaching on Edmund's influence in the region. So people, like you said, were no longer going to Edmund, but were going to Thomas to support, to sort out their legal issues, mm. even though Thomas didn't have authority over those lands. And did he, did he have a title? Did you say he had a title? Or? Earl of Surrey. He was an earl. Yes. We can also imagine Edmund, who was well known for pomp and circumstance... And rather flamboyant. I just loved how they put in that he was flamboyant. Yep. Would continue to be enraged at the Duke of Buckingham, who Edmund should have been above in status, was now being prominently put farther ahead of him. So now the Earl of Surrey was being put forward in front of him to precedence. And the Duke of Buckingham did not keep his mouth shut like a good gentleman would. You can almost hear Nelson from The Simpsons going, ha, ha, ha. That's exactly what it felt like. <laughs> Point and laugh. So he just kept stressing, I'm ahead of you. I'm ahead of you, and now others are ahead of you too. Mm. <laughs> Don't you suck. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Edmund. I'm feeling really quite, I mean, apart from the fact he committed murder, I'm feeling quite sorry for him. Yes, <laughs> except for yeah. the murder. But even then, we don't actually know if he did. Yeah, but he didn't seem to think it was relevant whether he did, which is even, yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't like him, but I do feel quite bad. <laughs> feel for him a little bit. Yes. I don't know, but you can think of, feel, I feel for him because he would be someone who's used to winning tournaments, mm. expecting to be the most important person behind the king and queen and their immediate family, would be one of the highest people in the entire country for status and authority, and he's not, and he's slowly going lower and lower and lower. Yeah, I mean, he, he must be panicking. I mean, how how low can he go? And it doesn't appear to be him not trying, because he's doing everything Henry is requiring of him, and it's not gaining him anything. Mm. How frustrating would that be? You're not even managing to maintain status. And you've, you've sided with Henry, even when your brother went against him yes. and actually died in a battle, and you're still siding yes. with the man who effectively killed your brother. Yeah, who is slowly taking away mm. your money, your status, your respect. Yeah. And you're still trying to be loyal. Was, was Henry trying to do this? Was he trying to humiliate him? And It appears to be systematic. Mm. Yeah, it was entirely intentional. But not, I don't think, because he didn't like Edmund. I think it was because he was trying to put a buffer up. Like, Edmund can't be the next person on the throne because look at how little authority he has. Yeah. Look at how little respect and status he has. Yeah, actually, that's quite a wise move, isn't it? Yes, except for the fact that it backfires, yeah. kind of. Kind of. Not really. Yes. There is also some speculation that Edmund started becoming disaffected with Henry's rule. This is about the time when Empson and Dudley are starting to come on the rise. Mm. Edmund is very focused on chivalry, status, and protocol. The king is supposed to be the ultimate chivalrous person in a region. The king should be somebody that you look to to be the most honest, the most bold, the most brave, the most respectful. And it's not doing that. And it looks like the execution of the poor little Earl of Warwick. I still say little in my head. He's still yes. a kid, but I know he was in his 20s. Yeah. Mentally, I get the feeling that he was still a mm. child. The Earl of Warwick was Edmund's cousin as well. Yeah. I don't I don't know whether he knew him as well as John de la Pole did, because he, I don't Edward think and so. John were in York together, weren't they? Yes. And Edmund wasn't. He was not not there. But still, if I were him, I would have done the same thing. I would have taken that as a foreshadowing of what was going to happen to me. Not only that, but he is obviously very keen on his rights as a nobleman 
as we've heard. Yes. And these yes. upstarts are getting they're getting above him as well as if, as well as all yes. the other noblemen. Mm. Yeah, they're now deciding the life and death of an earl. Mm. I mean, that is and they, really rubbing his nose in the, his face in the dust, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, hmm. I don't know if any of our listeners have watched any documentaries of the Tudors, but there's one with David Starkey and another one with um, Tracy Borman. They brought out this beautiful parchment roll of the descent of the Orcus. It goes all the way up to Adam and Eve and comes all the way down. And on this, they've got Henry VII squashed off to one side. And instead of a beautiful royal red line going through that descent of the roll, it's got a black line going all the way back up where he could have claimed to the throne. And is that a sign of illegitimacy from... from yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Catherine Swinford. We know that's what they thought anyway. Yes. It's kind of true. Hmm? There is a good possibility that this parchment was given to Edmund after John's de la Pole had died in battle, after his brother had died in battle. So they think it was John's, because it's for the de la Pole family, and then it was given to Edmund after that. He was very aware that his royal lineage was better than Henry's. Mm. His royal lineage didn't come through an illegitimate marriage. I mean, he's actually, in his own mind, he's ahead of everybody, isn't he? Everybody, including the king. Including Henry, mm. which I think is probably his downfall. Mm. Regardless of it, if it was the slights from Henry or just the continued reduction of his status or the fear of being executed, or if for no reason he just felt he would be a better king, Edmund decided it was time for a change. And it was time for a drastic change. Not only was he going to leave, but he was going to make a claim to the crown. Even though so we see of, what happened to his, his brother. Yes, but mm. if you think about it, and he's thinking, I'm going to be executed anyway. Yeah. What's stopping me? I think this was a huge misstep on Henry's part. Because at the beginning, Edwin seemed to be towing the line. Mm. And it's almost through Henry's actions that it seems to switch. Yeah, there's nowhere so, else he can go now, is there? No, Edmund, it's like me. Henry's paranoia brought about exactly what he was paranoid for. Yeah. So we're now in 1501. Edmund and his younger brother Richard flee England, again with an entourage suitable to a duke. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, it's not sort of you know, hiding in a barrel as you go across the, 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 the channel. I mean, everybody must have known he was going because... He's taking 50, 60 people with him. a crowd of people with him. Yeah. <laughs> you take several ships to cross the channel because you've got that many people. Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure how he managed to just get on a boat and go without Henry getting in the way. Yeah, I mean, Henry knew everything that was going on in the ports, didn't he? Yes. Mm. So you've got Henry. He has already executed the Earl of Warwick, who was a claimant to the throne. And we still believe that it was because Ferdinand and Elizabeth required it mm -hmm. for the safety of Catherine. Arthur and Catherine's wedding is coming up. And Henry now has another claimant to the throne, attempting to take the throne from him. And this one is a viable claimant. Yeah. He has a better claim to the throne than Henry. So he's just hanged Perkin. Yes. Thinking, right, done and dusted. And then... Yes. Yeah. Now an even worse threat pops up. He must have had a lot of sleepless nights, mustn't he? No wonder he looked <laughs> yeah, thin it... and gaunt. It wasn't just consumption. It was just... <laughs> It was worry. <laughs> but at the same time, he did this one to himself, I he think. He did. He did. Because all of the indications prior to that first indictment and him losing all of his status, Edmund was towing the line. He was fighting for Henry. He was very outspoken in his support of Henry and his cousin Elizabeth. Mm. Henry turned him himself. That's what I got the feeling from everything I've been reading. It really feels like this was entirely... Henry's fault and Edmund now had no other choice. I'm going to be executed either way. I might as well go for the throne and at least then I'd be safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we were wondering earlier in Arthur's Ed episode why Henry went so above and beyond with the wedding, it became so much clearer once I started <laughs> researching Edmund. How am I going to prove that I am still the king and in charge because I've now lost this most dangerous person abroad? Mm. 
Yes, and I've just been reading when we talked in the Patreon episode about Leonardo, we were talking about the Sforzas and how much they went in for pageantry and because yes. they had Leonardo choreographing their pageantry. And one of the reasons for that was because they had absolutely no right to be there. <laughs> <laughs> they were using shock and awe to try to hammer it home mm. that, yes, we are here to stay. It's a mixed, yeah, a mixture of shock and awe and, and bread and circuses and... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Uh, the only good thing for Henry at this particular point in time is that the wedding can't be stopped. You remember that Catherine was not going to be sent over because the Earl of Warwick and Perkin Warbeck were still there? Yeah, well, they've gone. She was already on a boat. All right. It took her a while, though, didn't it? Was, oh, was she very yes, seasick, did. I remember? Yes. Yeah. Poor, poor girl. I feel for her there. I get seasick as well, oh, so gosh. I do feel for oh, her. Oh, do you? <laughs> Oh my gosh, I never sleep better than when I'm on a sailing boat. Mm. Oh, I love that. So good. <laughs> he doesn't have to worry about Catherine being denied him because she's on a ship and she can't be recalled. So they're moving ahead with the wedding. Have they already had the um, the preamble when, when uh, Arthur married the Puebla? Yes. Mm. So, so it's pretty much official now. I mean, that is the wedding, isn't it? And then she comes along and just confirms well, it. They did that with de Puebla before she got put on a ship and sailed to England. Mm. But it wasn't 100% in Henry's hands until she was on a ship. Because now Ferdinand and Isabella wouldn't be able to recall her. She would only end up in England. It's not like they can send a, a faster, tinier ship as a courier to the ship that she's on and tell her to turn around. Mm. I think that's actually the only reason why the wedding kept going, if... If Isabel and Ferdinand had found out what Edmund was doing before then, I don't think they would have sent Catherine. No, it didn't sound like it. No, they had already refused twice. Yeah, I mean... Because of dangers. And I just imagine Isabella mm. was thinking, oh, for goodness sake, Henry, why have you got yourself into this situation? <laughs> what is wrong with this situation? <laughs> this is constant. Henry, not only had he lost a duke, someone who was born a duke and who was now an earl... They also lost one of the most prominent persons that should have been in the wedding party and part of the signatories. He was also to be the captain of one of the jousting teams. He was that good at jousting that even though he was still being docked down, he was going to give such a spectacle that Henry was still going to bring him out as a jouster for Arthur and Catherine's wedding. Now Henry has to find a replacement, make it look as if it was the king's idea rather than Edmund's disloyalty, Find someone just as prominent to be a signatory to the marriage ceremony to be sent back to Isabella and Ferdinand. And raise another person that could turn out to be yet another threat to Henry. So it's suddenly become really overt. I mean, if it hadn't been for this wedding, it might have been brushed under the carpet. But suddenly yeah. everyone's looking. Exactly. And noticing the, the entire world is looking. Yeah, and noticing the gaping hole and the jousting Yes. Line up. Yeah. Mm. I found that fascinating. It became such a huge problem because so many monarchs had sent ambassadors to witness the spectacle. Mm. And he's not there. So he was losing face very publicly. And that must have given Edmund, I mean, he probably thought, oh, I'd quite like to have been there because I'm pretty good at jousting. But also he mm -hmm. must have thought, ha. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, this will learn him. Mm. Yes. Not that it did. No. Henry, so much aware of the possibility of a threat if he raised anybody else, turned to one of his relatives, Thomas Gray. He was the Marquis. Marcus? How do you pronounce that? I think it's that? Marquis. Marquis of Oxford he is, isn't he? Yeah. Thank I you. I would have thought Marquis. I mean, I don't know many Marquis. Oh, actually, hang on. There's the bloke from Longleat, the zoo. He was a Marquis. And I think he was a Marquis rather than a Marquis. Okay. Yeah. We'll stick with Marquis. We'll go with Marquis. And if, if okay. we're wrong, feel free to let us know. Yes, please. <laughs> Thomas Gray, the Marquis of Dorset, who was a grandson of Elizabeth Woodville and a cousin to his wife, the Queen Elizabeth, but he was from Elizabeth Woodville's non royal first husband. He chose Thomas because he was the son of a commoner rather than a son. Like through cat, he was Elizabeth Woodville's 
grandson, but not Edward the Fourth's yeah. grandson. So he has absolutely no claim to the throne. It was the only safe person that he could put in that was still a cousin to Queen Elizabeth. But no matter how he put a spin on it, Edmund's absence was very much noted by the ambassadors and very much put around Europe. Right. Yeah. So this was a slap in the face to Henry on a very, very public scale. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and he's almost, he's set it up really, isn't he? He's, he's saying, right, we're having this massive wedding and uh, someone's missing. And Yeah. And while people nowadays are like, you know what? I'm not feeling well. I'm not going to come to the wedding. Yeah, you went anyway. Yes. <laughs> you were in Tudor times. Unless you were dying, you went. Mm. And now there's this hole. During the second exile, if you want to call it a second exile, he left England, but this time not without a defined destination. The first time he felt more like he was sort of a leaf in the wind being blown wherever. He didn't know exactly what he was going to do. This time, he had crossed the North Sea to land in Flanders on the Dutch coast, where he then traveled to Austria to the court of Maximilian, the Holy Roman Emperor. Mm. This is our first introduction between the two. And it was not a move that was a shot in the dark. It turns out Maximilian had made a promise to support the de la Pole brothers before they left England. Not only for funds and safety, but apparently to gather financial aid to attempt to take the English throne. Mm. Sir Robert Curzon, who was in voluntary exile from England, and there is a lot of debate of whether or not he was a spy, he had been fighting for Maximilian in some of his wars and was at Maximilian's court as an honored guest. He told Maximilian basically that Henry was an evil king and that Edmund was a noble and the rightful heir and was being unchivalrously treated. Maximilian agreed that, quote, if his majesty meaning Maximilian, might have one of King Edward's blood in his hands, he would help him recover the crown of England and be revenged upon Henry, end quote. And I suppose this, this time he has got someone of Edward's blood, whereas before yes, ab- he was just hoping he had. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. This one is nobody's disputing this it. One's... Not even Henry's disputing it. Mm. In their flight, Richard and Edmund... Not only did they receive support from Maximilian, but also from Sir James Tyrell again. And William Courtney, the king's brother-in-law. Yeah, he's Devon, isn't he? Yes. Yeah, yeah we've come across that problem before, wasn't it? Because they mm-hmm. they didn't, they let Perkin go from Exeter. And it was thought yes. that it was because he might possibly have been family. <laughs> yes. Mm. Right, they're all beginning to fit together now, these people. <laughs> it's like a puzzle when you think of how many people that are married to so and so, but then they change their last name mm. to be either a title yeah. or or just an area. All of a sudden, it's somebody of something, but it turns out, you know, they actually should have the last name. It's very confusing trying to getting through these. And I was just trying to work out where we are in the Italian wars and what Maximilian would have been doing. On that side, as well as this, and then That's I thought part of the political no. part that I removed. Yes, I thought, <laughs> no, this is no. I'm to leave that one for the time being. <laughs> yeah, I was so worried that this was going to turn into mm. uh, just a mess. That's unless you've got, it's almost like a a web yes. diagram yeah. of how everybody's linked. And we did originally think of of doing that, and then we just thought, no, this web is just going to get absolutely bigger out of control. And, bigger, and, and we'll hear about all this in Maximilian's episode, yes. which I think will be be a, a multi-parter, Maximilian. It's going to have everywhere. to be. If we're going to make sense of all the schemes he had in place at the same time, mm. and so contradictory. <laughs> oh, well, good luck to whichever one of us gets that one. <laughs> <laughs> Watch, you're going to pull him for me now. <laughs> I'll be crying. <laughs> no, I think that one will be pretty amazing to read about, actually. Mm. Mm-hmm. So no wonder Henry was scared and angry. Like, now he's panicking. Instead of a pretender, Henry had an actual claimant to the throne on the loose in Europe, demanding support from other monarchs and getting it. Yeah, I mean, if they can support really quite dodgy characters like Lambert and Perkin, I mean, how much more are they going to support Edmund? Yes, when they can trace his line of descent on both his mother and his father's side, and he actually comes from royalty and nobility. Which is more than can be said Mm. for Henry. 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maximilian at this point was Edmund's only possible route to the recovery of his status, land, and throne. I suppose by this point, Auntie Margaret hasn't isn't really a player anymore, is she? No, no, no not really. No, she's she's almost penniless, I think, at this point. Oh. She lost all her lands in England because she mm. was a traitor to Henry. So she lost that income. And then when she was no longer the uh, Duchess of Burgundy, she was the Dowager Duchess. She was on Dowager lands rather than the actual land she had originally. Mm. And she had to give up some of those Dowager lands to Juana. Mm. So she didn't have enough money to be any sort of influence now. And she must be getting on a bit by this point. I would think so. <sighs> Maximilian was definitely thinking Edmund would be better on the throne of England. For one thing, if he's a friend, he'll get more funds. And that is Maximilian's main focus. I need money. He was so bad with money. It was incredibly He gets given money. a lot of money, doesn't he, by lots of people. Including Henry. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of money. <laughs> But if he was a really good friend to Edmund and got Edmund on the mm. throne, he could demand more. By now, Philip had already written or accepted a treaty that required Philip and Burgundy to return Edmund and his brother to Henry should they go to Philip's court. So Henry has managed to close off one avenue. So that's after Philip was shipwrecked? No, this is before, before. Philip is shipwrecked. All right. Yes. Oh, because yes, he he agreed. He just agreed to things that he had no intention of doing at this point, didn't he, Philip? Yes. yes. Edmund may have been gullible, or honestly didn't know how Maximilian operated, because he took Maximilian at his word. Ooh, don't do that. I am about to get army. I am going to get ships. I am going to get money, and I am going to take the English throne. He should have learned. I mean, he's been, been offered things all his life. And all his they life. never come. <laughs> no, which makes me think he's really gullible. Like, I'm leaning towards gullible. This is not like his earlier flight, but he didn't have much support at that one. And everybody who promised him something during that flight, none of it manifested. No. But I'm going to believe that this is going to happen. <laughs> there, the difference between the first flight and this one is there would be no going back to England. To be forgiven. And there's no way he's going to get the dukedom. No. What he didn't seem to realize was that his first flight had put a bunch of his colleagues at risk. Well, now he had flown again. And his friends and colleagues are now in even more danger. Because this time, instead of saying, I just want my dukedom and I don't want to be indicted for murder, I am very outspoken that I am coming for the crown. Yeah, they are now accessories to treason. Yes. Yeah. Ooh. Top that off with him finally arriving with Mac at Maximilian's court and him saying, where are the ships? Where's my army? I need to get going. And then Maximilian saying that he could not aid him because these treaties with the Holy Roman, what was that called? Oh my gosh, I just lost it. <laughs> League. Sorry. Oh, the Holy League. The Holy yeah. League. Because of the treaties with the Holy League, he couldn't actually help him now. Oh, because Henry signed by this point. Yes. Oh, and they've all meant to look after each other. Yep. Even though they didn't want to look after Ludovico Sforza yeah. when he was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm going to say I'll do it, but I will select who I will do mm. it for. Oh, oh gosh. Imagine, imagine that. You get there. You've got these high hopes. You, you think, right, this is it. I've got an army. I'm going to be king. What yep. do you mean I haven't got an army? What do you mean I'm not going to be king? <laughs> yes. But wait a second. But you said. <laughs> you, you promised. And he's like, okay, well, Maximilian says, I will give you safe passage throughout the Holy Roman Empire because I don't wink, wink, nudge, nudge, know exactly where you are, mm. even though I've signed this treaty. I will give you a military backing of 5,000 men instead of the more robust army I'd promised you. And I'm not going to give you the ships, but the King of Denmark is an ally and he's going to provide the ships. Oh, we haven't come across the King of Denmark yet, have we? No, this is the first mention. Mm. And I don't think the King of Denmark knew he was supposed to give ships. <laughs> I did not heard anything about this at all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I didn't see That's... anywhere where Maximilian actually had a conversation about this with the I King bet, of Denmark. I mean, from what I've gathered from Maximilian, I bet in his head he would. He said yes. I mean, all you've got to do is ask. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It was so you've funny. Got, I, I think like, you've got two deluded people here. 
<laughs> just building each other's, each other's dreams up, saying, yeah, we can do this, we can do this. <laughs> and nobody's, nobody's asked anybody else. <laughs> Because we he can was make like it to the moon. <laughs> yeah, he was like that with Perkin, wasn't he? Because he was saying, "Oh, any day, yeah, Perkin's gone over to England. Oh, apparently he's he's marching on London. Oh, apparently he's got yeah. the king in a headlock or something." And it turned out, no, yeah. he'd run away. <laughs> Where did you get this information? I can find not a single dispatch. I I went off. Okay. King of Denmark, we haven't heard of him before. I really want to bring him into this and sort of swoop in another country into our our narrative. Yeah, there was no dispatches, no communication whatsoever. I have no idea where this came out of his mouth from. I could find nothing that said that the King of Denmark even knew who Edmund was. Or or even Maximilian. (laughs) (laughs) He might have known who Maximilian was, but I think the King of Denmark was quite aware that Maximilian was unstable. (laughs) It's just so weird. Like, he's going to provide the ships. What? (laughs) (laughs) The other question is, is how is Maximilian going to pay? He has no money. He's borrowing money from everywhere. He's Mm. signing treaties. And the only way he's signing treaties is if people pay him to sign the treaties because he needs the money. (laughs) Yeah, and I know once the Fugas take over from the the Medici as the top bankers, Maximilian is one of their main clients. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and he's probably i don't we don't even know whether he's got his wife out of hawk yet do we? oh man oh i'm not sure when he, she goes into hawk oh that was during perkins time yeah mm. oh yeah so, she- so it's earlier well maximilian sent edmund to aachen lovely very nice yeah i got that one <laughs> <laughs> no, nice nice <laughs> cathedral <laughs> Here, Edmund began to plan and gather supporters. And I was wondering, how in the heck did Edmund gather supporters without being able to pay for them? Mm. Well, it seems he was getting allowance from Maximilian and other undisclosed monarchs. Charles? (laughs) (laughs) Unknown. It is honestly Mm. unknown. It could have been Philip. Maximilian could have told Philip he had to help support him. Philip is still his son and required to do as he's told. Yep, Philip. But monarchs, plural. So then I started wondering, well, James IV was supporting him. Did James got so any maybe money? maybe he was sending him. I don't know. Has well, anyone know got any money? the king of Denmark. <laughs> that's the only one I'm 100% sure <laughs> of. Henry's the only one that's got any money and it can't be him. Or well, can it? Yeah. I mean, it's just... <laughs> With his spy ring, I wouldn't doubt that he was offering him money to try to draw out as many supporters as he could to nullify them in the future. Yeah. That really went through my head a couple of times. That sounds quite Henry, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Mm. So other supporters for him came from East Anglia, where his lands were, and were loyal this includes people like Sir John Wyndham, although in Wyndham's case, it may not have been loyalty to Edmund as much as it was a resentment against Henry for their own quarrels. Remember, Henry was now sucking the people of East Andi- Anglia dry mm. and reducing their own influence. Apart from the De, the, uh, De Vere family. Yes. And presumably the Howards. And the Howards, mm. yes. The Howards were on the rise because of this whole thing. Mm. Sir James Tyrell, captain of Guinness, or Guinness? How did we decide it? Guinness? Yeah, let's call it <laughs> Guinness. <not> beer. <laughs> Castle and Sir Robert Curzon, captain of the fortress of Ham, also defected to Edmund. They abandoned their post, took their people, and went. Ham has a bit of a reputation, doesn't it? Henry should have seen that Yay. one coming. Because, um, yeah. Oh, what was his name? Uh, Block? No. Something like that, wasn't it? Yes, and he defected. Up up sticks with... With the porters. (laughs) (laughs) The guy's running behind him with the luggage. (laughs) Who we know wasn't really a porter, because somebody did point out with that. (laughs) Yes. We were being... We were trying to be funny. (laughs) (laughs) No, he had a very interesting life, John Fortescue. Yes, he did. He he comes up in all sorts of guises. But anyway, we're getting sidetracked. Yes, we are. Between 1502 and 1505, Edmund had to be at the very least frustrated. Mm. The forces and money Maximilian promised never appeared. No. They never developed. Anybody else who promised him 
goods, men, and supplies, all of it fell through. Well, would they carry on if they knew that Maximilian, and presumably Maximilian was going to be the main donor, and they were just topping it up? I mean, would you carry on if you thought, well, he's not getting, he's not getting the main bit? Why should we try and? I mean, it's, our contribution is going to be minimal, and it's not going to be worth yes, it. And no, it, we'll keep going, and we'll get to that. Okay. Edmund was running out of money. He left all of his goods in England. He couldn't take it all. He was taking people rather than his own items like tapestries, things that he could have sold for good money. Mm. All of that was left behind. So he didn't do a John a John, and send it on beforehand because he didn't know yeah. he was going, I suppose, did he? Yes. Mm. He just up and left. Henry had seized everything that he left, so he now had no income whatsoever. Anything that was a loan that somebody else was provided from Edmund, because they were expected to give money to their retainers, Henry took it back. So now even his retainers didn't have funds. And anything that he left in Flanders after he arrived there, he did take some stuff, was no longer accessible because Philip had promised not to support him. Mm. So now that was seized, too. It wasn't given to Henry, but it wasn't given to Edmund either. He couldn't go get it. Philip wasn't part of the Holy League, though, was he? No, he wasn't. That's a separate... He stayed out of it. Mm, separate issue. I wonder how he managed to stay mm -hmm. out of it. I suppose it just wasn't his business. It was more Maximilian's business because he was so very literally interfering. <laughs> there was some mention in the politics that um, Philip's counsellors, because he was constantly moved around and he was not raised by Maximilian had hammered into him how bad war yeah. was for the country and for him himself. Yeah. yeah. So he didn't, he only got involved in one war in his entire reign. He did. If I remember correctly. He did, yes, against uh, yeah. elders. Yes. Edmund was also bleeding money. And I mean hemorrhaging money. His bro He had to keep himself, his brother, and the retainers in a lifestyle that the retainers would expect them to keep. Otherwise they'll leave, wouldn't they? I'm not sure where they'd go. Exactly. They can't go home, can know. they? No, but maybe they could go to Maximilian. <laughs> he already had three English exiles in his court, mm. including Robert Curzon, and he was supporting them. He was borrowing money left, right, and center, all based on Maximilian telling those people that Edmund was a good risk. No, no, he's going to be king of England. Ooh. I promise you, he's going to be king of England. Why anyone would believe Maximilian, no. I don't understand. No, you thought, yeah, a sensible banker is not going to take any notice. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to be so surprised if we do research Maximilian and it turns out he was amazing and he's being maligned by all the other monarchs. Could be. All the other books. Could be. We've, we've, uh, we've turned things over before. Yes, we have. Repeatedly. But in everything I've read about him so far, he didn't follow through on a single thing other than his marriage. And then he gave her up as a loan. Yes. <laughs> a, yes. What is that? Guarantor. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, she was a hu human banker's draft, wasn't she, poor woman? Yes, she was. <laughs> <laughs> she is lean on the mortgage. Yes. <laughs> Edmund finally opened his eyes and began to distrust Maximilian, and he left Aachen. He was worried that Maximilian was going to get paid enough by Henry to actually give him up and turn, return him back to England. Which, which is possible. <laughs> it's easily possible. <laughs> <laughs> he left his brother Richard behind as a hostage to his own debts. So now Richard is in prison. Sort of. It is a gentlemanly arrangement. And I asked about this, and I looked it up. If you were given somebody as a guarantor, they were to be kept by the person that you have provided them to as befits their station. So it's actually costing the person who gave the loan more money. Mm. It's only after you have reneged on your promises of when you're spending or when you're returning the money or what you're supposed to do that they end up going into a decline of circumstances where they say, well, now I'm taking this away from them. You know, may, I'm making it worse for your brother. You need to give me your money. Mm. And if you haven't got the money to pay up, poor Richard. Eventually, they're going to end up in prison and held in a cell. And mm. I, I didn't read of anybody being executed, but I, I wondered what they did to the hostages. And sure enough... I will keep them in comfort and to their station. And they were free to roam and visit people and and participate in activities. 
But if you don't pay by the time, their circumstances slowly degraded. Pretty, pretty seriously, mm. actually. <laughs> England's diplomacy dogged him wherever he went. He basically got chased from place to place to place. Well, I suppose Henry has already set up um, this, the framework in, on, on the continent because he's done it mm -hmm. twice before. Well, he's done it three times before. So it's all, it's all going to be there. Yeah. To. It's a little more difficult for him for this one because Maximilian went into a treaty with him for Perkin Warbeck. But when Maximilian went into a treaty for Edmund, he would he entered into the treaty, got paid the money, but then said he would only give him Edmund if Edmund arrived in the lands he himself held. And then he, so Edmund started going from dukedom to dukedom to dukedom because he just made sure that he didn't. Yeah, yeah. that he didn't himself personally have control over the holy roman emperor isn't a king the way we think of the english king he's a voted in overall ruler but he still has to do everything with the support of the dukes in each area mm. so a lot of sort of mini kings and princes princes so edmund just went from one dukedom to another with Henry following him and entering to treaties, diplomatic treaties with each person to get him returned. So everywhere the doors are slamming shut and these ah. Yes. But as soon as Henry's money had been turned over, oh, we lost Edmund. He's already left. Mm. Sorry, he was he was here a minute ago. <laughs> Henry's also frustrated. <laughs> I'll just I'll just pop in and get Oh no, he's gone. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm keeping the money. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's lucky he's got a never ending supply, old Henry, isn't it? Oh, he's so lucky of the alum mm. trade. Honestly, if he didn't have the alum trade, I think there is no way he would have been able to do this. The amount of money in gifts, and I put that in quotes, that he would give to enter into treaties for the expulsion of and return of Edmund was staggering. Mm. 10,000 pounds to Maximilian for one single payment. Well, it's 100, 138,000 pounds altogether to Philip. Yes. Which is a lot of money yeah. these days. <laughs> Yes, and then you've got all these great gifts of money going to one person after another because Edmund had to constantly be on the move. For those three years, he was only situated in one spot. It looked for about three months before he had to flee again. Mm. So frustrating for both of them. Yeah. Edmund was going from one country to another, hoping for support, only to get expelled within a couple of weeks because Henry had paid money. You think, was he ever grateful to those that harbored him, even for that short amount of time? Because they could have given him up to Henry and just not told him that they were being paid. But every single one of them said, I just got a great grant of money from Henry to return you. Can you please leave? And then I'll say, I lost you. I bet he was. Do you think he was grateful? He doesn't seem the type, does he? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he was either. But I suppose, I mean, he's getting so frustrated and probably panicking that he's running out of places. I mean, he's going to be turning to the yes. Sultan soon like everybody else does. <laughs> <laughs> and the Sultan doesn't care because Henry's too far away and he's still going after Venice. Yep. Yeah, the treaties with England were supposed to have Edmund and his brother captured in return, but not a single one of the rulers actually did that. Mm -hmm. Four years. Even the one who was holding Richmond at Aachen, he didn't give him up. He said he lost Edmund. Oh, and and I can't give you Richard because he's a surety for loans. But I'm still taking the money Henry gave him. Because I suppose Henry wants Richard as well, because if if, if Edmund, Edmund dies, goes, he's Richard's just got, the next in yeah, line. he's got the same problem. Exactly. Although it doesn't seem like Richard was as much of a concern because Richard doesn't seem to be an independent thinker. Well, that's even worse sometimes because you get um, someone else pulling his strings, don't you? Someone like Richard. Maximilian. Yeah. Wherever Henry could not use diplomacy as in treaties for uh, trade, which was his prime, I don't know, carrot, he used just bribes, straight bribes of jewels and money. He was doing everything he could. Henry was even paying Edmund's friends and retainers that were with Edmund to desert him and were offering full pardons if they returned to England, and several did. He did that with Perkin as well, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not only going to strip you of places you can go, but your own supporters yep. I'm going to take away. But I, I sat there thinking, God, these people are stupid. <laughs> Look at what's happening to Edmund. Mm. You think you're going to go back and actually manage to 
keep all your stuff? But I suppose I suppose it says it makes a point saying, look, these people could be bought. You know, they probably were bought by yes. Edmund, and I'm buying the back. You know, what, what sort of people are these? Yeah, very true. Henry also, again, used the stick against Edmund's supporters in England. So Henry's just eroding Edmund's support on both ends. His supporters in England, he's rounding them up and executing them for treason. Mm. The list of those accused was not restricted to those of power and influence either. Servants like Tyrell's servant Robert Wellsborn and shipmen that had aided the escape and moving of Edmund's goods were taken and executed. So he bought passage, and they were accused of treason and executed. William Courtney, the son of the Earl of Devon and the unnamed keeper of the castle of Porchester. I'm sorry, I know he was the keeper of the castle, but I couldn't find his name in any of the documents. Even in his, the damage to that court roll doesn't, you can't read the name. Um, Sir James Tyrell and Tyrell's son, Sir John Wyndham, were taken. Matthew Jones, who was a yeoman usher, were all arrested. Sir Robert Curzon, and this is where people start thinking that he was a spy. He was indicted, but he was never actually tried. It never went forward, and he managed to retain absolutely everything. So people believe that he was a spy. I'm trying to remember what's the name the name of the one that was in a similar situation in in Perkins thing that was that was Curzon wasn't it I think it's the same man yeah so I'm he went back sure. and did it again yes mm. well now he's proven himself to be reliable for Henry mm. why wouldn't you use the same person yeah and if nobody knew that he'd been spying initially for for per- on yes. Perkins side then you know he's he's the best for the job, really, because he's shown that he will stand up against Henry in whatever circumstances. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The knights were beheaded, the commoners were hung, and the poor shipmen, who were probably the least Mm. (laughs) offending, because they were just taking money to ship goods and people, were hung, drawn, and quartered. Edmund and Richard were kept informed of the goings-on at the English court so that they knew what was happening to their supporters. And that was deliberate by Henry. He wanted to ensure mm. they knew what was going on. That was not There's not a not point doing it if, if, if Edmund doesn't know. Right. But you think they must... He must have been setting up so much discontentment in England. I mean, all these people have friends and relations and... And families. Yeah. And there was quite a bit about the fact that people were... Um, horrified by what happened to some of the shipmen. Mm. We say shipmen, but something we should remember is that boys at the age of five would start being on ships. Mm. So there is a possibility that these were some children that were hung, drawn, and quartered. Mm. Yeah, I was just thinking about the, the, the film Master and Commander. It shows that quite a lot of them were really quite young, weren't they? Even at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well that's horrific. We don't I can't guarantee that it happened and I can't guarantee that it didn't happen, but there is a good possibility. Hmm. It's gonna be quite interesting when we do our last episode on what we think of Henry, isn't it? Yeah, because this really did not sit well with me. But I don't have proof that it actually happened. Hmm. And I suppose, you know, on both sides there's gonna be slurs and mm-hmm. hmm. So there is a gentleman in Edmund and Richard's retinue, and his name is John Chamberlain. And he was the source of all the information from England. We can't say if Chamberlain was a friend or a spy. I'm thinking a spy, since the person he used to obtain the information for the De La Prole brothers was a confirmed spy for Henry. And John Chamberlain got out of this rather well off at the end. Did Edmund realize that he was a spy? No. (laughs) John Chamberlain stayed very close to him the entire time. The harder part, which really started making me not like Edmund, was he didn't care. He wasn't concerned about the people in England. I will set it all to right when I am king. You can't set it to right if he's been executed. You can't stick the heads back on. No. Wait, he, he, he showed no concern whatsoever for the situation. I, that, that really turned hmm. me off of him. I might, he might have thought he had problems of his own, really, I suppose, at this point. But 
Yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, yeah. I'm having people are dying for me. And I'm not even going to show a care for that. And that really didn't, yeah, I didn't like that. No. Either way, if you think that it was, well, I'm in this situation or I'm too astounded, it, it, he comes across as a sociopath. He doesn't seem to be affected about anybody's situation, including his brother's when he left him as a hostage. Like, I know that was a common practice, mm. but when Edmund was finally taken and Richard was still held he didn't seem to care even more people were accused by henry in 1503 we've got oliver st john two more shipmen were executed their heads it's probably st john st john was for some inexplicable reason pronounced st john st john John. (laughs) yep for st john yep wow okay yeah there was a oh i'm trying to think what his name was politician relatively recently whose name was st john weird (laughs) okay two more people were held in prison awaiting execution like it just continued henry was eradicating edmund's support in england you've got you've got two people on either side who don't care and these poor souls in the middle going back to alison hannam she seemed to focus her research on edmund which was lovely she provides evidence that's really hard to ignore that Robert Wellsborn, who was that servant of James Tyrell that I mentioned earlier, was actually a spy and passed on communications and efforts to for the Delapoles to Henry. So whatever the Delapoles De La Poles were doing, he would send back to Henry and then he would get information and pass it on to Edmund about all the horrors that were happening in England because of him. There were a lot of spies. I mean, it's amazing how many people so they, many they, they turned. If you've got money, then yeah. you can have spies, can't you? Yeah. Easy. Yeah. There is some question still uh, if Edmund's faithful steward Killingsworth, or Killingworth, that stuck with him, he may also have been a spy, as one of Edmund's letters was evidence in the trials, and it was a letter that had been transcribed by Killingworth and hadn't actually been delivered to the recipient. Mm. So how did you get the letter? Mm. The lengths Killingworth went to keep his master well cared for, and the fact that no reward was ever given to him makes me conclude that he was not a spy. He did not come out of it well. And if he had been a spy, I would think that he would have survived as much as Robert Curzon had and John Chamberlain. But he didn't. What we can say is that the use of spies was not only unquestioned, it was rife everywhere. Mm. Everywhere you turn, somebody could be a spy. Like, how did you trust anybody? And that that goes with everybody, doesn't it? I mean, Edmund, Henry, you just, there was, must have been, must have been a horrible time to be there because you just couldn't, you couldn't trust anybody. No. Whoever you were. Yeah. Mm. But it's like, well, so it's like living in a dictatorial state. It was a dictatorial state. Mm. Yes. Mm. One such person, which is another thing that we'd never see today. If you go through the court trial rows for all those men that we were talking about that were executed, one person provided statements and evidence that led to the conviction and the execution, but his name is never mentioned in any of the court documents. He is just mentioned as a loyal subject. So you can't even face your accusers because that accuser is unknown to you. Mm. How could you cross-examine somebody if you don't know who they are? And you don't know what evidence they're going to give. They've given evidence, and they've given evidence and written affidavits, so you don't even see them in the court. Mm. How do you refute that? How do you call that person's testimony into question? Well, you're not you're not intended to, are you? <laughs> no. no. That's not how it's been set up. Yeah. It, it really felt like some of these trials were completely fixed. We knew what the outcome was going to be. We just need it on writing mm. so that we can follow through and make it look legal. Alison, I loved this. Alison calls this man X in her articles. <laughs> I love that. Oh, deep throat. It's not often that you get a whimsical feeling from a journal article. Usually they're very stodgy, but she wrote really well. Maximilian at this time turns around and starts trying to arrange a reconciliation between Edmund and Henry <laughs> rather than providing the support Edmund kept being promised was coming. Well, for a start, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And secondly, what the... Edmund... <laughs> 
What's Edmund thinking now? I don't know. Well, we do know this part. Edmund was in no way willing to reconcile. We have his response written down. Quote, I promise you, Henry and I will never be together in England at once without injury to one or the other. End quote. Well, that's very true. Yes. <laughs> one of you is going to be That's just stating a fact. <laughs> yes. Maximilian seemed to have this weird fantasy that Henry would still give back all of Edmund and his followers' lands and money that he had taken, but that they could continue to remain living at Maximilian's court. Oh, and so then they could pay rent. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you think this was going to happen? Yeah, he lived in a world of his own, didn't he? He did. He sent, Bless him. He sent diplomats and he to Henry, and Henry would also not countenance a, a reconciliation. He cut them short. He didn't even let them complete their presentation, which was so against court protocol. That was really an offense. It's like having – later on we'll talk about how – Queen Elizabeth I made, after the St. Bartholomew's massacre, she made the French ambassador stay on his knees for hours, which was a slap, basically, saying you are not yeah. worthy enough to rise in front of me. Henry kicked them out. <laughs> like, no, nope, we're not having this conversation. Well, I suppose he probably thought, but you're wasting my time because I can tell you what the answer is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This might have been what made Edmund start questioning the sanity of Maximilian, which he actually did question the sanity of him. Um, even if he he didn't question the sanity, he no longer trusted him. He finally opened his eyes and was like, this isn't going to work. Because of that, we lose track of Edmund from 1503 to 1504. During that, the years previous... Edmund had full faith in Maximilian, so he was sending him updates on where he was, what he was doing, what support, and trying to get Maximilian to tell him, when are the military coming? Who's supporting me? How are we going to get to England? That conversation just ceases. Edmund doesn't write to him anymore, so we don't know where he was because he's not sending anything to a single person where we have documents being held. And that's because he knows it's not happening. Yes, that. Mm -hmm. And Edmund became much more cautious about putting his location in the letters that we mm. do have that survived or his intentions. Everything became a lot more cryptic instead of being right out in the open. Because originally he had a full friend in Maximilian and Maximilian needed to be kept informed in order for all this to come to fruition. Now he doesn't have that. So he's taking more care of himself than he did. In 1504, we see that he is now so broke and is so disheartened, he puts himself under the protection of the Duke of Gelders. Yes. So we have spoken about Gelders with Philip. Mm. But also... Now, presum presumably this, has, this, this being so poor thing has a, has a knock-on effect with poor, poor young Richard. Yes. Mm. And... It's something that we'll think of later. When we're talking about how everybody is woven in, Gelders is a com country that should be familiar to people who knew the history of Henry VIII's fourth wife, Anne of Cleves. She almost became the Duchess of Gelders before she married Henry. Mm. And then because Henry married Anne of Cleves, the Duke of Gelders ends up reaching out to Henry VIII for, <laughs> from what I understand, marriage advice. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all linked in. <laughs> Don't ask Henry VIII for marriage advice. What the heck? Well, he's had a bit of practice. <laughs> <laughs> Initially, Edmund was a guest, which included a written agreement that if a reconciliation between Henry and Edmund could not be made, which Edmund now, because he had no money, no friends, no nothing, was trying to get back to England or at least be free to go. If that reconciliation couldn't be made, then it was in writing that Edmund would be free to leave. Mm. The Duke sent diplomatic dispatches abroad stating Edmund had 6,000 armed men with him in Gelders. I was not actually able to find any evidence that that force actually existed. So I'm wondering if it was made up to try to tell Henry, you know, he actually has support. You might want to have a reconciliation with him. I don't know why that was made. Did, or did Henry make it up to dangle this in front of Edmund and then so be snatched away and say, huh, not? Yeah, no, this was the Duke of Gelders telling Henry that Edmund oh, right. had 6,000 men with him. Oh. Like 6,000 armed men. 
1505, so it's now a year later, because of Henry's machinations in the background, Edmund went from being an honored guest to being a prisoner of the Duke of Gelders. The Duke had broken his written agreement. As a prisoner, Edmund blamed everyone else for his being in Gelders in the first place rather than himself. I was advised to come here when I, I didn't see anything being advised. Edmund wrote to Philip's counselors requesting that Philip demand Edmund's release so that Edmund could then join Philip. The Duke of Gelders and Philip had a treaty. Hmm. And technically, Gelders was in some way under the thumb of Philip because he was definitely within the Holy Roman Empire. So through Maximilian, through Philip, maybe Philip could do this. Didn't work. Edmund and this didn't... is before Philip invaded. I'm about to cover that. <laughs> Philip did not demand Edmund's release as he and the Duke of Gelders were having an armed battle. <laughs> they were fighting. Instead, Edmund's release turned out to be a coincidence. Philip didn't actually know he was there yet because his Edmund's dispatches hadn't arrived. Edmund was being held at the castle of Hatham in Gelders, and this happened to be the castle that Philip took. <laughs> Philip managed to get it during an invasion. Invasion. So that July, Edmund was delighted that he was freed by Philip, thinking that Philip had gotten his dispatches and had done it intentionally. <laughs> Instead, Philip was like, oh, you're here. <laughs> Who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> they, they had met before. They did know each other. But it, Philip had no idea he was there. Under different circumstances. Yes. <laughs> That's it's how deflating. <laughs> He's constantly being deflated. Yes, isn't he? so you came for me. I didn't come for you. <laughs> I didn't know you were here. What am I going to do with you now? I've got a treaty with Henry. Yeah. Could you not just get back in the dungeon and ah. keep very quiet? <laughs> <laughs> Edmund was delighted he was freed in July. August 4th, Philip returned him to Duke of Gelders to be a prisoner again. <laughs> yes, no, I remember that from, from Philip's episode, and it seemed a, an odd thing to do. Yes. Especially since by that point, he had captured Gelders, I thought. Yes. And so he was effectively sending it back to a, a part of his country. Yes. But not telling Henry, because then he said to Henry... Oh, I, I can't. Come. He's in Gelders. There's nothing I can do. Yes. Yeah, so that, that turned out to be part of the unofficial treaty between the Duke of Gelders and Philip. So Philip was right. required to give back Edmund to Henry from Philip's treat, treaty with Henry. So instead, he returned him really quickly to the Duke of Gelders. So I don't have him in my power. The mm. Duke of Gelders could then use Edmund as a pawn to get more money. And part of that money that he would re get from Henry was supposed to then go to Philip. It was this very convoluted back alley. Let's not give him up because he is a money cow. Cash cow. So how furious must he have been when he had to give him up for nothing? Because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the reconciliation between Philip and the Duke did not last long. They were back to fighting within weeks. <laughs> like, it was just horrible. Edmund... Well, I was thinking about when he was shipwrecked. Yes. And suddenly he's not getting anything for, for Edmund all. apart from being allowed, you know, pat on the head and off you, off you go. Yeah, so he didn't get the money from the Duke of Gelders because the Duke of Gelders didn't get any money and they were now fighting and he wouldn't have given Philip anything and then Philip gets shipwrecked no. and has to give him up for free. Mm. <laughs> ah, comedy no wonder he was so grumpy and petulant all the time. <laughs> yes. Edmund was now a full-on prisoner. He was held as a prisoner, barred windows, you name it. And he could get no news of either Philip or the Duke's intentions where he was concerned. Yeah, I remember he wasn't, he was treated much worse now. Yes, yes. Because yeah. he was not, he wasn't any use to anybody anymore, was he? Yeah. Mm. He was technically being held in luxury. While they did put bars on his windows and he was restricted and he was watched, he was still considered to be held in luxury because he was in a room, he wasn't in a dungeon dungeon. But as rumors began to swirl that the Duke was going to put him in a secure prison before he handed him over to Henry, Edmund managed to escape somehow, but we don't have any details of how he escaped. Yeah, he couldn't have bribed anyone, could he? No. It didn't do him any good. He was recaptured almost immediately, less than a mile down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Bless him, he can't do anything right. Yes. <laughs> Richard, still as a hostage in Aachen, sent letters out pleading for money to negotiate Edmund's release and was denied by every single person that he contacted. 
Yeah, which is more than Edmund was doing for Richard. Yeah, Richard, Edmund just left him there. Yeah. September of that oh, same Richard. year. Uh, so we're now in, we're still in 1505. The Duke handed Edmund over to Philip of Burgundy as part of their re-reconciliation. Philip called Edmund a guest, but Edmund was not allowed to leave. Philip did provide an allowance and gifts of clothing, but it was still a prison, and Philip was ensuring he kept him because he was now a pawn in trying to renegotiation, tr renegotiate trade relations with England to get a better deal. Like Burgundy mm. really got... A, a raw deal in the Intercursus Magnus. That's why it's considered the cursed treaty in Burgundy. No, no, it's the malice. The malice. Malice. It's the, the next. The next one. That's the uh, cursed one, isn't it? Yeah, this or one wasn't we, very already... popular either. No, no. But it gets a lot worse. Yeah, the next one gets Cause worse. It, the, the, yeah, because the previous one has a reciprocal agreement. Yes. Whereas the second one doesn't. <laughs> this move proved fateful. Edmund was now ungrateful to everybody, including his retainers that had been supporting him through all of this. He was writing scathing letters to them that they weren't purchasing him everything that he wanted, and they weren't aiding him in yes. his release. Yes, I've ca I came across those letters, and you think, do you understand your situation? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you're asking for incredibly expensive things because you're still talking as if you were a duke. Mm. You don't have money. They're paying for it out of their own pocket. Ugh. Yeah, he has very much an idea of um, self-privilege, doesn't he? That is, is assumed privilege. Yes. Yeah. We do have some of Edmund's letters. And what I read that he was writing now made me actually start to question his sanity. Yeah, I yeah the letters, I thought he's lost it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... Allison put it better than I did, so I'm just going to quote her here. He was preparing to offer Henry grandiose terms that there was no way he could fulfill. Yeah, he was negotiating from a position of power in his head, wasn't he? Yes. Whereas, in fact, I will give you this, 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 and this, and bring in supporters from the continent for your reign. He doesn't even have supporters. No. No, I think... He's sitting in this room with completely delusional, delusional thoughts. Yes. And, yeah, I mean, you've got to feel a bit sorry for him. He's obviously, yeah, it's, 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 it's all gone wrong. And he's sort of compensating in his head. Yes. But he's, exactly. he's, still, he's still up there. And it honestly felt like mania, manic depressive. Mm. You've got this, these grandiose and their florid terms in his writings to Henry. And at the same time, you've got the letters going to Philip that are begging and disheartened and just fully depressed, begging to gain better living conditions before Philip was to leave with Juana to Castile. Like, you please, you can't leave me like this. I need more answers. I'm, I need to be able to go out and play tennis. I need to be outside. It, it sounds like somebody who's almost in uh, a segregation cell begging to be let out but he wasn't he was still held in luxury he was still able to do those things he just didn't have freedom mm. so it makes it sound like on one hand he's got these grandiose and i'm extra excited i so think that this is going to happen and then in the next one i am so low so when I'm, he's up he writes to henry and when he's down he writes to philip yeah that's exactly mm. what it feels like as we discussed in Philip of Burgundy's episode, who was now the king of Castile, but not crowned, mm -hmm. Philip and Juana were to travel to Castile to be crowned, but they were forced to land in England to avoid capsizing in a storm. Mm. They were, quote unquote, guests of King Henry. <laughs> <laughs> they were honored guests. Yes. I mean, he really pushed the boat out. Well, <laughs> probably a bad, bad, bad uh, analogy for poor Philip, but he did really push the boat out for him, <laughs> didn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Ah. But while they were guests, they still weren't allowed to leave. No. So, yes, this is the time. Sorry, I said the wrong treaty before. This is the Intercursus Magnus. On the 9th of February, the Intercursus Malice. Magnus. Malice, this one. Malice. Thank you. <laughs> was signed, and Edmund's fate was sealed. Philip was forced to extradite Edmund to Henry prior to Philip being allowed to leave England. So, of course, he has yeah, to. Yeah, I, th I think they got him as far as Calais, didn't they? And then Henry thought, okay, 
we've got him. Yes, because Calais was go. owned by England at the time. Yeah. Edmund re- arrived in England in March 1506. It was important enough to the country for Margaret Beaufort to put her his arrival in her book of hours. Yeah, well, I suppose this really is a red letter day for, for her, isn't it? Um, for, for, for her it's son. It's the last. Yeah. It, it's not the last. Richard's still out there. But Richard, for some reason, never gave Henry any pause or concern. I'm not sure why. The only thing I can think of is the the subtle comments that I see of him not being all there, sort of like the Earl of Warwick. Makes you think that mental... So we're, into, we're into goose and cape on time again. Yeah, but we mm. really don't have a lot of information, and part of it is because Richard may have been that way. Does he Does he come back? No. Richard? No. No, he, st- he just left him there. N- well, yeah, Edmund had to leave him there. He had no mm. yeah. no recourse to get him out. Uh, do, we do, do we know what happened to him? Yes, we do. But we'll get ah, Okay. Okay. What we did. I'm worrying about him. <laughs> <laughs> I know, the poor guy. Um, what we didn't tell you in Philip's episode or earlier in any of Henry's episodes was that Philip did stand his ground on one thing. He only agreed to release Edmund to Henry if Henry would swear to pardon Edmund for all his offenses and treat him well all his life. It was stipulated he could not be put in a dungeon. Hmm, that's nice. Yeah, he could not be executed. You could not go after him further than you have already done. And then Philip said, okay, fine, I, I will give him to you, which I thought was quite, I don't know how else to put it, but ballsy to be demanding mm. that when you're in Henry's clutches. Yeah, I suppose Henry might have thought, it doesn't make a slight bit of, bit of difference for me, really. Yes. I've got him. That's all that counts. Yes. And in fact, to appear merciful might be a good PR stunt, might not it? Yeah. But Philip did give him up. And this is when Edmund's brother fails him. Richard, still a hostage in Aachen, and really struggling. He's not being held in very good circumstances because Edmund didn't follow up with the terms of the loan. He abandoned Edmund's cause, found someone who was willing to pay to have him released, and then made arrangements for his own refuge in Hungary and spent the rest of his days in Hungary. What cause? There was no cause to abandon by this point, surely. Yeah, yeah. Edmund was (laughs) totally taken. There was no way he was being released unless he escaped, but how? No, Richard seems to have made a good move there. Yeah. Yeah. When we go back to the document of Philip giving up Edmund to Henry, this document, way I read it, could be taken one of two ways. It could be read to mean that the treat him well all his life could refer to Edmund's life or Henry VII's life. Which doesn't last much longer well obviously no, want to know that doesn't ah okay mm-hmm. i'm assuming then that henry the eighth read it in the latter way <laughs> <laughs> for philip this was actually the best thing he could do regardless of if he was in england at the time he was not going to get any money henry was very close to getting edmund back on his own we know this from edmund's writing and henry's dispatches with the duke of gelders to be honest and I have to be pretty humble here. I I got Edmund's letters. I got a couple of them. And I lost the ability to even attempt to read it. I had no idea what was going on in this mind. So I actually, the first time I read it, thought he was seriously insane just by the writings. And it wasn't until mm-hmm. I read Alison Hannum's journal article that I understood why I was struggling so much. Spelling was not fixed. And it turns out everyone spelled words phonetically. Seems good so far, right? Mm -hmm. Except that everywhere in England spoke with different accents. Yes. And used different words for different things. Edmund's phonetic spelling lost me entirely. So was he speaking an East Anglian accent then? Or writing in an East Anglian accent? Yes. (laughs) So all of the stuff that I'd been reading in court documents and everything, and I was like, wow, I'm getting really good at 15th century English. Mm, But not Norfolk. (laughs) No, because I was reading everything with the pronunciation of London and the capital. 
because they're all written by people in London and at the Capitol. The court documents, death rolls, diplomatic dispatches that were either in French or Latin, that kind of thing. And I'd been reading those up to this point, and I was like, yes, I am so good at this. And then I read this, and I was like, what the hell? I don't know what's going on. So I'll probably do a couple of examples. And I'm going to do them from Allison's article specifically because I didn't figure these out. Words like cover were in there. Mm C-O-V-E-R. You think it's cover. No. Cover? Nope. Mm. I'm trying to approach it like a cryptic crossword. Go ahead. Let's see what you come up with for a minute. <laughs> um, is it a, is it a job? A, a, somebody who does this thing? Cove, cove cover. <sighs> uh, I'm trying to think of a Nor- Norfolk accent because it's quite similar to a Somerset accent. Cover my cover because we have my lover here in Somerset. That's what you call everyone. My okay. lover. Take the c cover. c sound and change it to an s. All right, sova, 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 sova. No, I'm not getting it. Sure. Sure. S U R E. Sure. And he spells it. Because the V is the well, V is sort of a an U F sound, playing. or a U sure, R sound. Sure. Like it. We also have to remember that there was that great vowel shift. Yeah. So the letters that we see there don't necessarily make the same sound like o was a u and a could be an o and there's another shift around this time as well as quite a big change yeah yeah in it all right sure sure and another word v-a-a-k-e-s works Mm -hmm. works works close you're getting closer the w is correct walks Walks. Watch. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Those are two. Every single word of his is like that. I don't think that's any, any modern Norfolk accent. <laughs> <laughs> it was so confusing. I, I, so you're looking mm. at it thinking somebody's writing gibberish and mm. has lost their minds, but it's just because he's phonetically spelling the way they pronounce things at that time. And we can't even use our own pronunciations because of the vowel shift. Yes, and the people getting the letters back in London must have been thinking, what the hell is this man going on Yeah, about? so that's where Killingworth came in. Killingworth was a London man, but also knew how to speak East Anglian and, <laughs> and listen to him. So he would just translate it. They kept saying he scribed it. No, he translated <laughs> it so that it became sensical. But Killingsworth wasn't there for these letters. So no. all I've got mm. are these crazy things, and I just gave up. I totally gave up. I don't know how Allison figured it all out. But once you read it through her translation, it's like, oh, that totally makes sense. <laughs> I felt so dumb. I'm like, what am I missing? Yes. So thank you, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> While Edmund had been held by Philip, Henry was not content on relying on Philip to give up Edmund. As Philip had already refused and had taken money and then said, oh, I lost him. Mm. Oh, he's renowned for that. Yeah, while he's negotiating this, so Philip had not signed the treaty yet. We're going back to the fact that Henry had already had his back channels getting this Mm. done. Henry had approached Maximilian again with the possibility of reconciliation between Henry and Edmund. Is this anything to do with um, Catherine of Aragon's nurse's brother? A little, yeah. yeah. Marrying a French girl instead, or marrying, going back to marrying Eleanor getting Henry to marry Eleanor hmm. rather than marrying Catherine like he had said to Isabella and Aragon. And by, by marrying Eleanor, I mean Henry VIII, hmm. betrothing Henry VIII to Eleanor. Henry also sent dispatches to Edmund as well for the possibility of a reconciliation. Edmund is now beyond broke, in debt. He's abandoned by his brother and he's ready to agree to anything. And so... Philip really didn't have any choice. Edmund was going to come back to England anyway. He might as well get a preferable treaty out of it. Poor Edmund. Well, I think poor Edmund now. Every single person that had agreed to support him had abandoned him or out and out betrayed him. Mm. And he had no one else to turn to for support. So he was very, I don't know, resigned to going back to England. He didn't fight it in any way. I suppose it might have been... 
quite um, comforting for him the way that Henry treated Perkin before Perkin jumped out of the window and ran away. Yes. He might have thought, well, at least I'll get that. Maybe. Although, of course, then Henry did hang him. (laughs) Yes. But at the same time, Edmund drew up conditions before he... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> before he agreed to go. And the conditions that he was sent to Henry were that he needed his dukedom reinstated. <laughs> All of his grandfather's, father's, and brother's lands and offices, offices, including being on the, the council, the king's council, were to be returned to him. Henry and his his council must have been falling about when they got these things. What the hell? <laughs> This is, again, I was like, are you insane? You now are in prison. You're being held against your own will. Mm. And you still think you can demand all these before you return to Henry. That Henry didn't give you even when you're in a better position to task for it. Exactly. Like, what? Uh, How on earth could you think that you were going to return better off than when you had left? (laughs) It was astounding. That's when I started thinking, like, seriously, he must be manic. He has to be manic. Delusions of grandeur followed by depths of depression. Unless he thought that by asking for a lot, he'd get a bit. Oh, maybe. Whereas if he didn't ask for anything, he might not get anything. (laughs) I should try that with my husband. (laughs) I'm going to get myself three dogs. And he'll say no and freak out. And I'd say, okay, can I get one? (laughs) I want another dog. I miss my babies. Anyway, back to this. Yeah, so when he's writing this, this is the other thing we need to think of. He is now a prisoner. He's not held in luxury. His windows are barred. He's got guards outside his door. It is a prison. It can't have been all bad. He was able to entertain officials and play tennis. But he was never left without somebody guarding him with weapons. Mm. Sadly for Edmund, his terms were... Not taken. They weren't even well, presented to Henry. They no, weren't. it turns out Henry didn't get them at this point. Philip had turned them over before Edmund's letter got to Henry. So right. he didn't even get a chance to try to negotiate this. <laughs> Edmund returned to England, not altogether unwillingly, according to Polydore Virgil. So he just came like, hello. Yeah, well, I, I would have thought, I mean, what, whatever happens to him, it's... At he's least not, it's an he's answer. not going. He's not going anywhere, is he? With no <laughs> in Gelders, no. so uh, or he could just say, "Everybody on the continent has failed him. I've got nothing left. Whatever." Mm. We're back to that lifetime problem in the mm. treaty, right? Edmund was shut up in the tower, technically not in a dungeon, but he did have to pay for his own upkeep. But he wasn't executed by Henry. No, because he promised not to. Yes. Henry VIII, 1512, so he did survive for a little bit, decided to take that that line in that treaty for all his life was in reference to his father's life and not Edmund's. So what triggered him deciding to do it in the end? If you remember, for the first little while, Henry gave out a pardon and then started sending people to the executioner's block as things weren't going so well for him. He had wars to do. He was leaving the country. There were... Edmund was considered a rival to the throne, and he didn't want to go to France and and start that war with a rival to the throne still in England. Yeah. I mean, if, if Henry got killed in the war... Edmund was king. Edmund's there, yeah. It was... Wow, that would be a surprise, wouldn't it, if they opened the door and said, by the way, you're king now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your majesty. <laughs> what? <laughs> Edmund met the, met the executioner's block on April 30th of 1513. What is interesting is he managed to live 15 years longer than his older brother, John de la Pole. Hmm? Mind you, he didn't, go, he didn't do well, did he, John? No. Came and went quite quickly. Yes, he did. Wow. Hmm. Okay, and now we rate him. <laughs> Okie dokie. And fibbly. I don't have a lot. Mm. <laughs> when we talk about amphibole... We're talking about intrigue, and Edmund seems to be kind of a simpleton. Yeah, I'm getting the impression everyone's intriguing around him. Yes, and he and doesn't he get it. He doesn't know it's happening. No, he comes across as very gullible with Maximilian. Maximilian has 
promised him things and it just consistently gets like, oh, well, it's not going to happen. But he fully believes in him every single time that plan change changes. Because he feels he has a right to it, I think. He's been brought, he's, he's just got this idea in his head, I'm, I'm the king, I have a right to all these things. And yes. therefore, they'll happen. And when people the tell me thing. they'll happen, of course they'll happen because I've got a right to them. Yes. Hmm. And I mean, even the idea of him taking the throne doesn't come to him. It's from Maximilian. Maximilian proposes that to Edmund, and then Edmund goes along with it. So I couldn't oh, right. even say... So he didn't even want it? Not at the beginning, place. no. Oh, right. He was still focused on just getting the dukedom. Mm. So I couldn't even say that he was intriguing in taking the throne himself. He was not the progenitor of that idea. I didn't know if you wanted to count the fact that he was actually attempting to get the crown. But when you see later, in his own negotiations with Henry, he's back to, I just want to be my du the duke again. Yeah, I've, I've, he'd been humiliated back in England, and presumably all he wanted was to be in a position to lord it over people and not be humiliated anymore. It's quite yes. quite a naive approach, isn't it? I just want, I just want what I had. <laughs> yeah, I want what is my birthright. I don't want more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's rather sad in a way, isn't it? That it really is. <laughs> all of this was just to get back what Henry took away from him in the first place. Yeah. Gosh, if Henry hadn't taken away, taken it away, none of this, none would, of have this happened. would have happened. None of this would have happened. No, in my opinion, he would have stayed loyal. He had been loyal up to that point. Yeah, I don't, it sounds like quite you know, quite a shallow character. All I want is to be able to boss people about a bit and to shallow be, and to be in the right in the right point in the jousting. Yes, but <laughs> well, not shallow, shallow but simple. I don't know. It's almost just... like he didn't have the imagination to go beyond. But then if he didn't want it, if he just wanted, I mean, maybe he was quite happy just jousting and that having his to position. the way he was, well, yeah. Which is fine. I mean, I don't want to be king. I'm not simple. <laughs> no, I don't want to be king either. I know what I have and I'm very happy with what I have. I'm not mm. looking for more or less. And maybe he felt the same. All I want is the dukedom. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's tragic, really, isn't it? Yeah. So for Amphiboly, I, I put down absolutely nothing because every, yeah. I couldn't include everything. This would be such a long oh. episode if we went through all the negotiations behind the scenes. He was not the negotiator, though. No. I can say that. Every no, because single he doesn't... person that he ended up with, yeah. they did the negotiations on his behalf. Um, to negotiate, you've got to have give and take. And if if you feel that you're entitled to something, you don't have anything. You don't need to, to give, give anything. No. Um, I mean, it, yeah. No, I think you're right. I was thinking that, that I mean, you've got to have something if you if if you're committing treason and going and trying to be king. But if he wasn't, yes, really, and he was so willing to give it up as soon as it wasn't a possibility. Yeah, if he wasn't like, right, really bye. trying to be king, yeah, I think. No, I think you're right. Zero. Okay. That's oh. a zero for Amphiboly. That's weird, isn't it? I wouldn't have thought he'd be getting a zero. Neither did I. I thought it'd be way up there. I thought this would be nothing but him, but mm. it really was him saying... Okay. I was thinking of a three-year-old. You know when you've got a three-year-old and he's very focused on one thing and you go, oh, look at this shiny thing I have. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh my gosh. And they drop whatever they're... They literally just let go of it and it falls to the floor and they grab the next shiny thing. <laughs> And then somebody else comes along and offers them something else that's even shinier. And they go and grab that, dropping that. Mm. But if you take the other two away, he's perfectly happy with the original thing that he had. That's mm. what it felt like. It felt like everybody around him was trying to influence how he was thinking. And he was letting them. I didn't find anything in there that was himself making the decisions and being the power behind his actions. But Maximilian must have been equally delusional because he's saying, be king. Yes. And I'll help you with all these things. <laughs> with the money I don't have, the people yes. I don't have, the ships I don't have. That's yeah, okay, if, the king of Denmark will do it. But if he hadn't suggested to be king in the first place, it wouldn't I don't matter. think it would have ever shown up. No. How strange. He just wanted to be a duke with his birthright. That's it. Yeah. I want what I feel is rightfully mine. Yeah. Mm? Yeah. Well, well. zero. Antiperistasis. Hmm. There's a lot of movement here, and none of it upwards. No. 
No. Technically, when his father died, if we just go with the strict rules of law, he did not have the income required to be a duke. It was perfectly legitimate, and previous kings had done it all through the ages, of reducing his rank due to the financial situation. Hmm. There was a bit of, I don't like you because you're a cousin and you have a better claim to the throne, so I'm going to bring you down. But if we were just to go with the strict letter of the law and standard practice of England at the time, this was a legitimate move for the king. He didn't, he wasn't entitled to be a duke. So I can't even say that he lost the dukedom no. for it, for his actions or anything. It was just a legitimate action. But he lost the earldom. And the he mar- lost the earldom. Mar- Marquis- Marquisery. Yep. He lost everything. Mm. Well, it's one of these ones where he's an, he was a noble and then he's... Well, he spent a lot of time in prison as well, didn't he? Uh, no, not really. It sounds like it. All but right. he was only in prison with the Duke of Gelders. And then Philip had him for a couple of months and then he went to England. So he was held from, what is it, 1509 to 1513. So he did have quite a few years that he was free and mm. running around trying to get somewhere and getting nowhere. But he did ultimately end up with absolutely nothing and being executed. Mm. Um, I suppose you knock a bit of point, points off for the fact that he wasn't as high as he thought he ought to have been. <laughs> yes, so, he was. So we're not going down from Duke. We're going down from Earl. Yes. And in my obviously... opinion, we are. For le- the legitimacy of yeah. the law. Yeah. I mean, Henry did have the option of giving it to him anyway, but he chose to follow. Mm. So Edmund is seeing a huge gap between Earl and Duke. Mm -hmm. So we might as well as well. So I think eight. Yeah. I was going to go for a seven Mm. just because I wasn't sure if he really deserved it in the first place. So I I brought him down a little bit just because he had delusions of where he should be. So I had picked a seven. So that is a 15 for antiperistasis. Martyrdom. Well, he died for his cause, but it turned yep. out that his cause wasn't, wasn't fantastic. Wasn't, wasn't what we thought it was. No, but technically he did die for what he wanted. Yeah. He was willing to let a lot of other people die and wasn't concerned about the fact that his supporters were being executed in England. Yeah, quite a lot of people were martyred. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's, I think because the fact he died for a cause, albeit a delusional one, he needs points. I I agree. Um, I'm going to go straight down the middle and go with the five because he died for the cause, but the cause was a bit ropey. I went with an eight mm. because he did ultimately die for the mm. his desire to have his dukedom, and he did go quite out of his way and put himself and his brother and many people at risk to get it. Yeah. Yeah. No, so you're I right. went I'll higher. Bump, uh, yeah, I will bump it up, I think. I'll go with a seven. A seven? Hmm. So that's 15 for martyrdom. He's not doing too badly. No. Although well, I, I was really surprised. I am surprised about the amphibole. I was yeah. surprised when I finished my research that I was like, I don't have anything. Yeah. And I thought, I thought that, that, was that would be, be nine, nine or ten for him. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. He lost everything. Absolutely everything. Mm. He was attainted. He lost his dukedom. He lost his lands. He lost his money. He spent most of his time on the run and did not have anything to provide to anybody. The only thing that I could say that he did do or pass on was it was his presence that provided the intercursus malice. Hmm. Which had an effect on Burgundy. And when you're thinking about um, how well he's known, uh, yes. Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel, I would say, were the names that people would remember. Edmund yes. de la Pole, no. Not so much. Possibly mm. because he never actually managed to get an army together to come to England. Mm. He was sort of that mosquito that you keep fly- swatting away, but it doesn't bring a whole bunch of other mosquitoes with it. <laughs> <laughs> Is he promised mosquitoes? Yes. <laughs> but they um, never shut up. Yeah, I'll go with a two, I think. I can't think he I don't can't think he can have any more than that. 
I agree. I was thinking a two as well because yeah. while he did influence Burgundy, that influence didn't last very long because that treaty didn't last too much mm. longer. And then he just becomes an obscure person in history. And Philip didn't last much longer after the treaty. So it became sort of irrelevant, really, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it was really hard to say because I thought for sure what I had in my head I thought was going to be this amazing thing. And then it turned out there was absolutely nothing. No, I mean, he was just chased around Europe. That's That was his life, wasn't it, once he'd taken the plunge to go? Well, yep. he had no choice but to go. Yes. In fact, it, it seems he has no choice but to do any of the things he does. He's just whooshed along by the tide. He really is. Mm. Flaunt a bleeding flaunt. Okay, they're yes. fairly sure that this is a portrait of Edmund. Right, well, he's got a rather dashing red beard. Mm -hmm. Very interesting hat. Very interesting It seems hat. to erupt in, in lots of directions. I mean, he seems to be wearing just an ordinary sort of close-fitting brown hat. and then Yeah, almost like a toque or a beanie, as the Americans mm. call them. And then, but there's a huge black beret stuck on the side with a ostrich feather. Yeah, which is supposed to be worn by dukes. Oh, I see. This is a propaganda mm. And what's the portrait. rosette on his... Is, Same. That a, is that a heart or something on there? It is his... There is debate about what it is. They're not sure if... Because he is... The Marquis, the Duke, and the Earl all have the same badge. So while the ostrich feather is a symbol for the dukedom, they aren't sure if the badge is also to reinforce the fact that mm. he felt he was a duke. One thing I want to bring your attention to, which is funny, is his collar. What we're looking at is a portrait of him. It's a profile portrait. Mm. Interesting nose. Interesting nose. Yes, he does mm. have an interesting nose. It's got Strange a lumps bump. and bumps all over it. Yes. And smile lines, which I thought were interesting to be added in. Oh, yeah. He's got smile lines on his face right here. Yeah. But the collar is open. It looks very much like a collar that somebody would have today on a suit mm. collar shirt with the collar open. There's quite a bit of speculation about whether or not that is supposed to be a symbol of him showing his throat and that that's an indication that he feels that he's powerful and invulnerable. Well, that backfired. Yeah, big time. <laughs> this was definitely painted before he left England. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And it it looks more like um, one painted in Henry VIII's time rather than Henry VII's. It's just got a different feel about it. Yes, it does. There's more detail to make it lifelike. Mm, he hasn't got that sort of winsome half-smile that they all seem to have. Right. I didn't even think of that. He's not smiling at all. Even though he's got his smile lines, he's got no smile at all. Strange, his neck seems to be... He seems to have five o'clock shadow on his neck, which is a bit strange. Yes. Yeah, the back of his neck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they shave the back of his neck every time he gets his haircut. Maybe he was just a hairy mm. man. I don't know, but the collar open and the fact that he's got the ostrich yes. feather to signify that he's a duke makes me think that he had that delusion of grandeur. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm a duke, whatever you say I am. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that umps, umps the, the um, numbers up quite a lot because, it, that, that, yeah, as a, as a propaganda piece, it's more interesting. It is very much a propaganda piece. Yeah, more piece. interesting than just a, just a portrait. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go for, I think I'm going to go for a seven or eight because I like the fact that okay. he's saying, I've got, I've got the feather, I'm a duke. Yeah, this is one of the portraits that really does mm. show symbolism is starting mm. in the portraiture. Yeah, I'm going to go for an eight. Okay, I am also going to go mm. for an eight. Aren't you glad you put that little feather in your hat now? <laughs> yeah, you actually got points for something. <laughs> so that's okay, a four. Okay, so that is... No, that's an eight. <laughs> that's an eight. We put them to add them together and divide mm. by two. That's an eight. So his total... Is 42. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. I don't think it's going to help him, though. No. He beats out, well, he beats out the Earl of Warwick, Arthur Prince of Wales, John de la Pole, Polydor of Virgil, 
And Philip the Fair. He beats Philip the Fair. <laughs> oh, but yeah. he's under Edmund Dudley. That would rankle. The commoner beat him. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's even it's even happening after death. What uh, the thing that was plaguing him throughout his life is happening five hundred exactly. years later. Maybe he would feel better that he beat Philip. Yeah, but then Philip was a duke too, so he probably thought he was on par with Philip. Hmm. Oh, no. He's an archduke, though. Oh right. Hmm. I don't know quite how these things all fit together, but it sounds it sounds bigger. Hmm. It does sound bigger. But the final question. Oh. Are they too delicious or what? I'm I'm thinking no. Why? Because of what we said. He doesn't actually do anything. <laughs> He's got this set, this ide fix, isn't he? That I want to be a duke. And whatever you say, I yes. want to be a duke. And the rest yes. and life just whooshes him about and buffets him. And he just keeps saying, but I want to be a duke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I figured mm. he was doing. So, it's almost like you can see him walking along like a, a duck quacking, but instead mm-hmm. of quacking, he's just saying, I'm a duke, yes. I'm a duke, I'm a no, duke. I've got the feather. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, uh, Edmund. I mean, I, I, I hate to put more misery into your life, but no, <laughs> no, no. I am the same. That is a hard no for Edmund. Oh. <laughs> And she weren't a duke. Oh. <laughs> I don't like to break it to you, but no. you weren't a duke. <laughs> you were not a duke. <laughs> Sorry. If we take it by the legal structure, by precedence and everything, you were never going to be a duke. Mm. Sorry. Yeah, someone should have told him. <laughs> someone should have. <laughs> oh, I was, I was, this is another one of those where I started thinking I knew exactly how this research was going Mm. to go and we were going to end up with this adventurer and I was going to be so excited. And in the end, I felt kind of sad for him. I do. Yeah. He just wanted the one thing. If if Henry had said, go on, go on with you then, have your duke and run along. Exactly. None of this would have happened. No. He would have gladly kept on going with the tournament route, doing the whole chivalry thing. All those people he wouldn't have no... died? Nope. They would not. Mm. He made absolutely no indication that if he was left to his independent life that he would have gone against Henry. I think this not... Henry's paranoia kicked the whole thing in, didn't it? Yeah. Mm, well done, Henry. Nice one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was 100% your fault. <laughs> Well, no, we'll do part your fault, part Maximilian's. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yeah. Well, shall you pull my next victim, mm. please? Oops. <laughs> and if it's Maximilian, I'm going to be laughing. <laughs> All right. We've got... Okay. Oh, this isn't too bad. Well, I hope you don't think it's too bad. Okay. Louis the Twelfth, King of France. Ooh. So, yeah, we haven't done Charles yet, so we're all straight on to Louis. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. That'll be interesting. So, for patrons, they will know a bit about him because we've yes. talked about him in the first episode of the not Leonardo episode of Leonardo. <laughs> <laughs> But so far, yeah, we should probably explain that because <laughs> <laughs> these our regular listeners won't have listened to that Patreon episode. Lucy had to give us context for Leonardo the the first episode, and instead Leonardo barely was in it. <laughs> it was Ludovico's <laughs> fault, so really, sense. and Cesare Borgia and a couple of other mindless thugs. Yes. But um, and I think that's actually going to give us a bit more information on the Holy League as well with Louis. It'll definitely yes. give us more information on Naples. Yep. Mm-hmm. And he goes right through to marrying Henry VIII's sister. Yes, mm. as an old, old man. Mm, not for long he didn't, but... No. <laughs> but the only thing we discovered about him was that apparently he has a tiny head. <laughs> that's all we knew. Yes, that's all we know so far. <laughs> no, that'll be good. Yeah. That'll be really interesting, I think. Oh, I'm excited about that yeah, one. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Oh my gosh, I listened back to when you pulled Polydor Virgil. I'm like, 
ooh, I did not sound happy. And I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how many listeners we lost for the Polydor virtual episode. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out to be pretty good. Yeah, it yeah. did. Yeah, no, I thought it was a good one. Awesome. So this is the end of our episode on Edmund Duke, Earl of Suffolk. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed it and will join us for the next episode on the Northern Renaissance. That's yes. Next. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd appreciate it if you sent us some reviews on Apple iTunes and shout out to us on Twitter and Facebook. Let us know how we're doing. You can find details of the podcast and contact us on... In the meantime, have more than thou showest, speak less than thou knowest, lend less than thou owest, ride more than thou goest, learn more than thou trowest, set less than thou throwest. This is nothing, fool. Hmm. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Man, I only want what I know is mine. I want to go back where all this began, so respect my honored bloodline. You deprived me of all my dukedom and all of my lands as well. Give me, give me, give me, give me, or I will raise such hell. Maximilian said I should be the monarch And if I don't get it I'll be raising a fleet With the help of the king of Denmark I demand the scepter I demand the crown I demand what is rightfully mine Give me, give me, give me, give me uh, oh. Oh, really? Well, just the truth, then.